This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got James Fox. James, the boy, how are we? Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So over 30 years, kind of leading the way for the phenomenon, which is UFOs. You've been investigating it for, like I say, over 30 years, all around the world, thousands of interviews. You've done mega podcasts. Joe Rogan, who's absolute Don, you've been on his show twice. He loves all that stuff as well. But this is the kind of stuff that I love, these conversations, because I'm not an investigator on it. I watch YouTube videos from time to time and it's appealing there's something sexy about thinking there's other life out there first and foremost how are you though i'm doing great you know uh, I, we tried to connect last time uh i was in manchester was i no i was in uh Chet i think you were in scotland was in the midlands yeah. oh i did actually yeah. come to scotland i went to edinburgh that's true uh -huh. you're totally right i stand i sit corrected awesome. and uh and we didn't manage to quite get there but i did say i'd be back and i'm so glad that we got to connect and i got to do this in person i think it's much better yeah doing it in person yeah it's more personal you know what i mean it's, um you can connect more to a whole different level instead of zoom i don't look i get asked every day to do zooms all around the world but i'd rather do it in person i feel as if the audience get more from it as well but these conversations this will do well because people are always intrigued people will think you're an absolute fruitcake people will think you're an absolute legend the same as myself it's to stay open-minded for everything yeah and the stuff that you do i love because you're not out there saying believe this and believe that you're only asking the questions getting the evidence getting the pictures the videos and showing it for people to then make their own assumptions or a pass their own judgment and that's the best thing because i think a lot of people can force their agendas or their beliefs yeah. onto everyone else and that's when people then ended up they'll not hate it but they'll just kind of go against the grain but it's to stay open-minded to everything even this conversation is to stay open-minded look into it yourself watch your documentaries you've done what six seven films and documentaries very powerful all different so it's just very interesting and for me it's just an a massive appeal to think there's other life out there i love that stuff so um Thank you for that intro. I, I, I one of the things that I like to make perfectly clear is that I I'm intrigued by the I call it the phenomenon because um, I only not only that do I have a documentary called the phenomenon, but I called it the phenomenon because it was referenced in government files in the United States dating back to 1947. Uh, if you look up a memorandum, I think it was General Nathan Twining referred to it as the phenomenon. Uh, it's something real and not visionary or fictitious. And so they they don't call it little green men or flying saucers. The government refers to it as the phenomenon because the phenomenon is, is complex. It's not uh, easily explained away as, oh, maybe we're having, this is a huge universe, right? It's Clearly, I think the consensus is is that it's teeming with life and that we get periodic visitation. And for whatever reasons, governments tend to cover this up 
uh, for lack of explanation. But it's it's not like as someone who's looked into it for thirty years, I've met with some of the most intellectual heavyweights in the scientific community that have really put a lot of thinking power into this. What is what are we dealing with here? There's no one easy answer. It's it's a complex complex issue, and um, you know I'd like to be able to tell your audience I've been at it for thirty years and that I have an explanation, but I don't. I can say that there are structured craft of unknown origin, unequivocally, whizzing around with impunity. They're, it's a global phenomenon. They're nuts and bolts. They exhibit a technology that, that is light years advanced from anything that we have. Um, they can, I'll give you an example. They don't have any wings, they don't have any tail. They can hover. Um, they don't make any noise. They don't have any exhaust vents. They don't do very little air disturbance. Sometimes witnesses report a slight humming. Um, and then they can accelerate from a standstill, from a hovering position to out of sight in a blink of an eye. They do right angle turns at high speeds. And, uh, and that is, that's irrefutable around the globe that we could prove that's happening. The question is, who is it? What do they want? Where do they come from? Is it some super secret government, uh, you know, hidden developed craft i highly doubt it because it's been going on for so long and it would have to keep a secret for 80 years or more so that's that's the big question is what are we dealing with yeah before we get into everything though yeah. i always like to go back to the start with my guests yes. get a bit of understanding about you jamesy boy where you grew up and how it all began uh oh <laughs> well i haven't i haven't been back there since but i <laughs> but I was born in Exeter, England, in the southwest. My dad was was British. My grandmother on, on my father's side my, uh, goes where our lineage goes way back in England. And um, uh, my parents moved from England to uh, Brooklyn in the seventies. And then my dad was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and he was dealing with this whole uh, health issue. I think he was given like a year or two to live back when I was just born. And um, it, it, uh, the, my father was just absolutely focused on finding a cure. He was kind of like me, like when you go after something, you you know, you're hell bent on on getting an answer. And and anyway, my parents split up, and they both went to California. My father went to Northern, my mother went to Southern, and so I I spent um, a good portion of my life in Northern California. How was that seeing your dad in a wheelchair his whole life? So he he was known like when I was really young. It was like, why does your father walk with a cane? You know, because he's with multiple sclerosis, he started to lose his abilities, his muscles, his muscles and stuff. Slowly, it would start in the legs and then sort of work its way up. But the legs don't just go out overnight. It's like slowly you become your your dexterity or your coordination starts getting worse and worse and worse. And you can no longer run. And then you're having a hard time walking. And then you need a cane. And so eventually, so I guess I, I, I saw the progression pretty slowly. And then it finally to the point where he could no longer walk. And so he was in a wheelchair, um, which was hard. But when he lost the movement of his arms, that was, that was really tough. Because now he can't eat. He can't get about. He can't go to the bathroom on his own. You really can't do anything on your own, you know, once you lose your arms. So that was tough. And I'd say he was a quadriplegic. And I was telling you this earlier that everyone said, oh, you just, because I became a dad a little later in life. You know, I was in my 40s, mid 40s when I became a father. And uh, everyone's like, oh, it's so tough. Well, you just wait and you got to change those nappies. And I said, I looked after a six foot five quadriplegic. And I was his nurse, his chauffeur, because my father was a journalist, his, his, his ther physical therapist, uh, his secretary, um, so I did it all, you know, uh, uh, growing up and it was tough, but it was also, we had a very special relationship because we were dependent in, in many respects on, on each other. So we had a very close bond. Yeah, that's, uh, you can see that though, even when I meet you, you've got a great presence, you've got a great energy. You can see you're a, a genuine good guy. And to do that is fucking heartbreaking as well to see a loved one up my old man was the same he was leukemia and he deteriorated mm, for, for yeah. two or three years the bloods wasn't so as prolonged as ms that can go on for years and years but 
to see them deteriorate and struggle, it's my mum who done all that work. I don't mm. think I was strong enough to take that role, even though looking back, I should have as a son. That's what you should be doing. But does that very tough then toughen you to then okay make you not a better person, but it can also make you better because you think, why me? Why did I need to go through that? Why my dad? And it, like you say, you can go both ways when you kind of involved with someone you love, see them deteriorate. Yeah, you know, for me, my father never complained. It was never pity poor me. He was always the life of the party. To him, people would say, Charlie, how do you do it? Because how do you do it? You don't, you can't move. And yet he would never complain. He was had the best sense of humor ever. He used to say to me, make me a promise in life, son. And I'd say, what's that? And he'd say, promise me you'll never take your legs for granted. And so I walk all the time, I go hiking all the time, and every morning I wake up and I jump out of bed and I think how fortunate I am that I can like move my arms and my legs and I can get about, and, and that is such a bonus in life. So I feel like I'm so ahead of the game. And, it, and quite honestly, if I lost, if I got some sort of illness and lost that capacity now, I would never have any regrets because I really feel so fortunate. I feel just really incredibly fortunate. Yeah. That I can, that I'm healthy. What were you yeah. like at school, James? Were you that kind of guy who was the little UFO kind of was lunchbox? It, or was, yeah, was no. that not even in your psyche no, not then? Even, no, no, it's funny actually, because when I was 19, I dated this girl, uh, Rachel Miller, and she was 20. She said, uh, Oh, my previous boyfriend was really into UFOs. And I thought, the, uh, why on <laughs> earth would you date a freak in the ufos like what are you thinking i it just really like she went down a notch for me i'll, I'll never forget it and she told me that my ex-wife was really in the ufos but why did i have that knee-jerk reaction and i think i think that it's it's been so hammered into us i mean there was a push in the 50s Right after the, uh, there was a major flap of UFO sightings in 47, and then we had uh, two consecutive weekends in Washington, D.C. of 1952, where the Capitol building was buzzed with these unknowns, these UFOs. And there were jets scrambled to intercept them. They were picked up on radar. They were seen visually from the, the pilots. It was crazy. The whole country heard about it. Anybody out there can just Google 1952 UFOs, Washington, D.C., they had a big press conference, and I'm getting to the relevance of this in a second. They had a big press conference. This guy, uh, General John Sanford, stepped out and addressed the nation, and apparently it was the biggest uh, uh, address, biggest press conference since the ending of World War II. And he basically, you know, they said there's something, what is it? Uh, credible people are seeing incredible things, something like this. Uh, they convened a panel from the CIA to figure out like how to deal with this problem. And it was called the Robertson Panel. And they adopted this policy for the Air Force in 1953 of ridicule. And it was a very effective campaign. And that campaign, I mean, you know, what's funny about a pilot reporting something that they're unable to explain in the sky? But that stuck and it was very effective. And I guess all these years later, you know, when I heard about UFOs, I would just laugh and think it's a joke. Mm -hmm. But yeah. do you see what I mean? It was yeah. an intentional, yeah. it was an intentional tactic and it was very effective. Do you think that's to deflect to think the people who speak out it to then make them crazy? Uh, no, no question about it. That happened in 1953. You can look it up. Robertson panel. Because I was, uh, E.T. was a big one for me. Yeah. E.T. was the one, I think it was the 80s. I was only a young boy, but... I always stood out and it was always interesting to think there was other life out there that could cure things and with a touch and they could see into the future. It's very all intriguing. People love the UF. Like I say, you speak out against it, people will think you're crazy because we haven't really, I've, and I always say this, but if unless I see it with my own eyes, I've got to think, okay, well, it could be hocus pocus, but then again, you've still got to be, just because you haven't seen everything doesn't mean that it's not real either. So yeah. what was that moment for you then when you decided a man who used to laugh about people who were intrigued by UFOs to then becoming one of the biggest investigative journalists in, in the world? Uh, I, 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 I want to get back to E.T. afterwards. Yeah, 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 I'm going to tell yeah, you a funny, course, yeah. funny thing with E.T. So uh, my father and I, 
my dad was a journalist and he would he was a mainstream journalist and we actually went to Gonville and Keys and interviewed Stephen Hawking. We interviewed race car drivers. Stephen Hawking had what I think it was Parkinson's, was it? Mm -hmm. Um Lou Gehrig's or Parkinson's? Excuse me, he had he yeah, was a in a few wheelchair things. As well. Yeah, yeah, he had a few things wrong with him. I think. And we went to interview Stephen Hawkins at Gonville and Keys. Of course, my dad being in a wheelchair and a reporter, and Stephen Hawkins being a reporter, and his book uh, uh, had just the big book had come out within a, within a year or two. I'll think of the name in a second. Um, but this episode is sponsored by Fire Away Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK with over one hundred and fifty stores. With their fresh quality ingredients and unique pizzas, they will have you coming back for more. Use code JAMES20 for 20% off. That's JAMES20 for 20% off. We were supposed to talk to Stephen Hawking about this revolutionary technology that enabled him to speak, to, you know, communicate with the outside world. And it was a software technology. And it was for a magazine called PC Computer Magazine. But, but Stephen Hawking's book had just come out. And we wanted to talk about black holes, you know, but it was sort of our in to Stephen Hawking. So we get in there and uh, we said, uh, my dad, we asked him about black holes, right? And he, Stephen Hawking typed with one thumb, for so long, I thought, oh my gosh, this interview is going to go on forever. Like, click, 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 click. I mean, like 20 minutes, click, 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 you know, doing a response. And my dad and I were so excited. And he said, uh, I thought this interview was going to be about computers, not God. <laughs> like, so in any case, so I would go around with my father on these different magazine reports and I would... I would be his chauffeur, his secretary, his, you know, his gopher, whatever. We were a team. And I was very supportive of his work. And then when I told my father in my early 20s, uh, a long time ago, that I wanted to do a documentary on UFOs, he was beside himself. I mean, he was, he, he was so supportive of everything else I'd ever done even things he didn't agree with. And he used to say to me growing up, like, son, I don't care what it is in life that you end up doing just as long as you're happy. There's nothing to it. It's a dead end road. You're wasting your life. Like, please reconsider. He had members of, of my British side of family writing me letters from England and saying, your father has drawn attention to the fact that you're doing this. And he's very concerned about the path you're on and that it's not, nothing to it. And um, I was kind of surprised that, I got that response, but I got that response from lots of people. And I had some, I had some people come up to me and they say, um, what's this on about, you know, UFO boy, they call me UFO boy, you know, what you on about? And, and I remember jokingly, I actually was quite offended on a number of occasions, but I, in one time in particular, I just said, I didn't feel like dealing with it. I said, uh, oh, I just do it for the money. And the guy sort of said, oh, that's a huge relief. Thank you. Of course, I was absolutely penniless, right? But that that's changed that's changed and you asked me about how i got to where i'm at today or how the perception has changed and i'd say that um i was the butt of many jokes uh ridicule not always but for the most part i mean obviously witnesses would be a different story we can have a serious conversation but for the most part it was laughter and ridicule for a long time and um I'd go to a cocktail party and I'd tell people, you know, my friends, please don't tell people what I'm doing. Like, it's just, I, mean, I don't want to spend the night defending my position on anything, quite honestly. It's my personal journey and that, you know. And every time I'd finish a documentary on UFOs, and it would take me years. I mean, they're very difficult. Getting access, I didn't have a name behind me. I didn't have like a mainstream new, news. They didn't really trust in it mainstream anyway, but... And so developing that, that relationship and that trust with witnesses and government insiders and military insiders, that took decades. And um, every time I'd finish a film, I'd say, never again, I've got other interests in life. But inevitably, that film would open more doors and I'd get more access. And that just keeps happening. And now I'm working with government insiders, you know, in Washington, D.C., like actively in D.C., you know, off the record for the most part. Not totally, but... So now I'm in, like, I, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in this thing. And, 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 um, and I, I feel like, uh, 
as I said to you earlier, uh, if I can ask your audience to suspend judgment for a moment and imagine that if there was compelling physical evidence to suggest that we're not alone, um, how can how significant of a story would you give that? And I think uh, I would imagine the vast majority of your audience might agree that it could be potentially one of the biggest paradigm shifting stories of our time. Well, I'm convinced that's the case. And so how am I going to walk away from a story like that? No, you're 30 years deep now. I'm 30 years deep now, exactly. How was that? I'll then? be like, a, yeah. I'll be with a walker. <laughs> uh, uh, beat, beat, beat me up, Scotty. <laughs> but is uh, more about it. When your dad is interviewing guys like Stephen Hawking, worldwide names, and you're going down that, listen, hocus pocus, fairy tale kind of route where there's not much concrete evidence back then to suggest that there was even life. Maybe you'll see it on the news or the newspapers, but again, yeah. how, how well can we trust? those people but why did you stick it why did you decide to stick to your path and stick to your guns i stuck to my guns because i went to locations and i met the witnesses first firsthand it's not stuff that i read out of a book i was that curious and these witnesses i'd look them in the eyes just like you and i sitting here and oh. and uh and i could see how excited they were that someone would take them seriously. They could actually convey what they saw, what they experienced without being laughed at. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why I've I've been su as successful as I have been. Not that I'm this hugely successful guy, but I've had success and I get more doors are opening. It's because I've provided very early on from my first film in the mid 90s, I provided a credible platform to uh, allow witnesses to come forward and testify or claim, just tell what, the, share what they saw. And I myself don't draw any conclusions. I don't say, oh, John and his wife, Mary, saw a UFO from Alpha Centauri, or, you know, I never say that. I don't know what it was, Could probably tell you what it wasn't, but, or where it came from, anything like that. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, and so people started coming to me and, and, and here I am all these years later. What was the first bit of evidence you got to say, okay, there's a possibility that there's unidentified flying objects out there? What was the first piece of evidence where you thought, okay, I'm going to give this my full life? Oof. You know, every time I finished a documentary, I, I mean, honestly, the first couple that I did, and in fact, the first film I ever did, and my father was telling me I was nuts, everyone was, I sold it. I worked on it for about five years. I sold it to Discovery Discovery Channel. It aired on the Learning Channel. It's called UFOs: Fifty Years of Denial. And when I finished that, I just I got to interview the six men to walk on the moon. Um, Edgar Mitchell, <clears throat> Apollo fourteen. He was amazing. Um, he talked a bit about Roswell. Talked a bit about some of the evidence of these these craft exhibiting this technology. Um, I'm trying to think of a specific case. Uh, Roswell's pretty compelling. Like we could go into that in a bit if you like. That was certainly compelling just because of the of the the caliber of of witnesses. Yeah, let's um, talk about Roswell. Was that nineteen forty six? Was, was that nineteen forty seven? That was I covered that case in my first piece. Is that the one with the little alien? Well, so what's the connection with well, that? Well, what I can do is I, I'll just give you the facts. Yeah. In nineteen forty seven. There was a, uh, a, it was June of 1947. There was a guy named Kenneth Arnold. He was a private pilot. He ran for lieutenant governor uh, in uh, Idaho, I think it was. And his name was Kenneth Arnold. And he reported, I think it was nine uh, objects exhibiting some weird flight technology. I mean, he was in an airplane uh, and he said that the way they skipped across the mountains uh, they were just completely inexplicable. He thought that he might have seen something that was a secret government craft under development. Wasn't sure. I don't think he thought alien. Mm -hmm. And he said the way it flew, it's sort of like a saucer skipping across water and the birth of the term flying saucer was born. And and there was, if you Google, you know, 1947 UFO wave in the United States, I mean, it was just every single newspaper had headlines about it. Mm -hmm. And... So it was getting a lot of attention. In July, the next, the following month, there's a rancher, uh, 
just outside of Roswell, New Mexico, comes upon a, de a, a debris field of, of unexplainable material. And he'd seen weather balloons and targets uh, out on his ranch from the local military base forever. So this partic particular material, um, he takes in, and everyone was talking about flying saucers at that point, he takes into the local military base, the 509th Bomb Squadron, and he says, uh, I'm Mac Brazel, I'm a local rancher. Uh, I got this debris, and the debris was completely unusual. It was like um, like there were I-beams with uh, little hieroglyphics, purple I-beams that you could not just, just you, couldn't, you couldn't damage with a sledgehammer or a blowtorch. Um, this memory-like material that was really light, and you could pick it up and, you know, according to witnesses, you can crumple it up into a really small, but it was feather. You couldn't feel it in your hands, and then when you would release it, it would retake its shape. So he brings this material to the local military base, and they, where did you get this stuff? And he explains there's, there's a whole, you know, huge debris field of it on my ranch. I think it could be from one of those flying saucers that everyone's been talking about. So a couple of military officers from the base jump in a Jeep and they go with this rancher out to the site. Um, yeah, it was Mac, uh, it was, it was uh, Mac Brazel, it was Major Jesse Marcel and another military officer and they go out to the debris field. They spent the night out there that night and, and, and they recovered like a truck full of it and they brought it back. And it was clearly, um, the, the determination was made rather quickly that it was, it was off world. So they uh, make a, a press announcement to the whole world that they recovered a flying saucer. And that's just, everything I'm telling your audience now is just factual. You can look it up. <clears throat> they were ordered to take some of the debris, put it on a B-29, fly it from, uh, and the 509th Bomb Squadron was the most elite hand select unit in the world, exclusively responsible for the deployment of atomic weapons. That's what the Enola Gay was parked there back in the 40s. So for these guys to mistake a common everyday weather balloon from anything else is just, it's, it's just not going to happen. So they announce to the world what they recovered. They take some of this debris, they put it into B-29, and they're going to fly it to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. That was what the authorities were done. But they're going to stop off in Fort Worth, Texas along the way. And uh, I don't know how many hours had gone by between that. You could look it up, probably the same day. And they load the stuff up. They fly to stop off at Fort Worth. Right, Patterson w was their ultimate destination. And there's a flurry. I mean, there's this story exploded in the headlines, as you can imagine, even in 1947. And there's a flurry of media activity on the base of the airplane when he's trying to get off the plane. And the, the debris that they had collected out at the field was in the B-29. And he gets off, and there's all these media bombarding him with questions. And the general, this guy, General Roger Ramey, comes up and he says, you let me handle this. Keep your mouth shut and let me handle this. And he gets... Debris, they have a press conference inside the building nearby. They threw a conventional weather blue on the ground, took some photographs. You can see those photographs today. And they said, terribly sorry, what we thought was a flying saucer. Turned out it was just a conventional weather balloon. End of story. You know, so that's what happened. However, two out of three of the people within the press photograph, uh, it, was, uh, it was Major Jesse Marcel, Colonel DuBose, came forward on the record, it's in my movie, The Phenomenon, to say that that was a cover story for what they depict up and what they picked up in the desert was not of this earth, not of this world. <clears throat> and since then, I don't know, you could look at a number of researchers that have been probably close to 200 witnesses, first-hand witnesses that talk about that account. And so that was the first major credible claim of a UFO crash and materials recovered, 1947. Was that after World War Two? Yes. So again, do you ever think that that could be a deflection to then forget about the war and move on because all the attention then goes on to something as big as that? All I can tell you is what the witnesses who were there said. How many witnesses again? Well, the most credible that have come forward were Colonel DuBose was, uh, and Jesse Marcel, uh, Jesse Marcel, Major Jesse Marcel, his son, Jesse Marcel Jr., also handled the debris. Um, the coroner, uh, there are a number of, but I would say all in all in the hundreds. 
Um, there have been memorandums that have come out regarding this. There's been little notes. I mean, Kevin Randall and um, uh, Stanton Friedman, they've done extensive uh, research on it and books written. But the people that were there, the people that the debris field, the people that recover the material, they are high level uh, military officials. And based on their report, what they recovered was not of this earth and it was covered up. So that's not my opinion. It's just what they said. Where was the photo of the little alien? There's an alien. Uh, uh, it's got a photo on it. It looks as if it's got half its leg blown oh, off. Oh, yeah. So that was, uh, uh, that was Santilli. Ray Santilli, I think he was from England. Who who actually, inv well, how the technology nowadays you can tell if something's real or fake. Yeah. But back then you probably couldn't. So who can tell who's the credible witness, who's not credible? <clears throat> who can tell if the photos are real or fake? Mm. Do you look into all that? Do you cover all those angles now with mm. the technology? Let's get back to the alien footage for a second. Yeah. That was Eric Schofield and Ray Santilli. It was in the 90s. And they were looking for memorabilia from England. Sorry, I think it was in Tennessee of Elvis Presley. They put newspaper ads out and they were trying to like find, um, because it's quite valuable, right? So they would go and put out ads and they would pay good money for any video, filmed footage of Elvis Presley, other famous stars of that time, of that period. And I guess they got contacted by a guy that said, hey, you know, I don't have any of that, but I do have some footage of... A, and they were, they, these guys weren't UFO people. They had no idea what they were dealing with. That story is kind of a long story, but ultimately the vast majority of that footage, I'm personally convinced is fake. But it's not fake because the event didn't happen. It's f possibly fake for another reason is that they got the footage, it was poorly handled. Once they opened up the, the canisters, most of the stuff deteriorated because it was 1947 and this was the 90s. And so, um, and they'd borrowed money to get the footage. And I think that they, based on the footage that they had originally had and originally seen, they they recreated it. That's what Eric Schofield and Ray Santelli would probably tell you today. I talked to Eric Schofield personally about it. What about the Rose? It's muddied the waters. The Rosewell and Brazil? Yeah, yeah, Roswell, Brazil. What's that one? So, uh, if um, I tell people that if, you don't know much about the phenomenon. Do not watch my movie Moment of Contact <laughs> because Moment of Contact deals with the Roswell of Brazil. From in 1996, there was a UFO, an alleged UFO crash in Virginia, Brazil. Let me back up for a moment. Let's see. Uh, to give an example of how difficult I it was for me to believe this case. I was working on my second film on the topic of UFOs in the late 90s. I just finished that first one. And I was uh, going over, like what I do at the beginning of a, of, a, of a film project is I do broad strokes. Like I'll say, okay, well, wouldn't it be fun to cover this case? And I partner up with people and yeah, we can look into the Bent Warner's UFO incident. We can, we can look into the Phoenix Lights or whatever. Uh, and, and my buddy who's British, uh, this guy, Tim Coleman, we just partnered up to do this film together. He goes, uh, he goes, oh, James, mate, you know, there's this case, British guy. There's, there's this case that happened, this UFO crash in, in Brazil. Happened in 1996, and it was like 99, so it was like three years later, maybe four years later. And uh, these live aliens apparently survived the crash. And, you know, they were captured by the military and the local police. They were seen by civilians and fire department and that. And, and I just thought, Oh my God, I must have, I think I picked the wrong partner. I'm like this guy's lost his bloody mind. And, uh, and I refused to even read one word about the case when I'd heard about it. And I remind your audience, I was working on a UFO film, my second one. And I refused to look, even look into it. And I'll, uh, I ended up doing a full movie on it, but I'll get to that in a second. I get a call, fast forward, it was 99, probably 2099. I get a call from Tim. We'd been in and out of touch for quite some time. And he goes, you did bloody well. I told you about that case back, you know, you didn't believe me. And I said, no, I didn't. <laughs> he said, and now you made a movie on it. I said, yeah, yeah, I did. And then I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a credit in the movie, a special thanks, because it'll be our inside joke that, you know, you told me about a case back all this time ago. I refused to even look into it, mate. I wouldn't look into it. Why? 
because it was like so I just missed this. Yes, there's no way that happened. No what? No, no way. So I just didn't look into it. So then, two thousand. Let's see. So then I did Out of the Blue. Then I did a second version of Out of the Blue, director's cut. Spent a couple of years on that. Then I did this big event at the National Press Club in Washington D.C. with Leslie Kane, two thousand seven. Made a movie about that. Sold it as a two-hour special to History Channel called "I Know What I Saw." Okay, so I'll give you an idea. Like I've been, and I'm going to Brazil on a completely unrelated, just to give a presentation at a conference. Probably on "I Know What I Saw," and I get a phone call, and it was 2011. I get a phone call from a guy named Jeff Zagansky, who's very, very influential in the entertainment industry. You can Google the guy; he's big time, big time. One of the most, he's the Joe Rogan of the entertainment industry and in terms of like television and movies and, you know, and uh, he's been a fan of mine and we've been friends and he's helped me over the years. And he goes, oh, you're going to Brazil. You got to look into that Virginia case, that alleged, you know, UFO crash. And I was like, oh God, not this again. And so I, I have such respect for Jeff. He's helped me out. He's gotten me like distribution deals and he picks up his phone and things happen. That guy, you know? So I didn't want to like laugh and dismiss him. So I just said, sure, Jeff, I'll look into it. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I'll do that. Click, no intention of looking into it. So zero. So I flew to Brazil and I'm staying in a place called Peruibi. And it was to the south, probably like, I think it was like three or four hours south of Sao Paulo on the coast. And it just so happens, Stanton Friedman, who's uh, synonymous with like Roswell, He's a nuclear physicist, UFO researcher, one of the brightest minds in the field. R.I.P. Stanton, he died a couple of years ago and loved him. He was one of the most credible, scientific, pragmatic guys in the entire UAP or UFO field. And, um, and he's speaking at this event as well. And I remember, uh, this funny little side note, there was an island off the coast of Peruibi, and there was a very... Uh, it was a snake that only, it's only one place on earth. It was this little island. Right, and you could see the island from sitting at a cafe on the water. And um, Stanton Fried and I would joke about it. And uh, apparently this snake on the island, is venom is so deadly. One bite and you're dead. But it's very valuable. So poachers would go to this island and they would, you know, these snakes would drop out of trees and bite them and they'd die. And so Stanton and I were talking about this, these snakes and this island. And, and um, we're, we have big, uh, you know, big uh, lunch parties with other witnesses and stuff, and somehow the topic of Virginia came up. And I have tremendous respect for Stanton. Really. I mean, you can look the guy up. And he said uh, something like, um, oh, yeah, James, you don't know about Virginia. I said, I was like, ugh. He's like, uh, well, I think that happened. It's like, really? So that sort of planted the seed in my mind, and then I started to meet additional witnesses and then I started really looking into it. Then I went to Virginia countless times, month each time. Every time I dug further, I thought, wow, I think this did happen. And then uh, I, in, I, was, I was putting together the phenomenon. That's the film I think you might have watched. Yeah, the I watched two phenomenon and yeah, out of touch. Moment of contact. Moment of contact. Mo moment of contact. Out of contact. Out of touch. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so the phenomenon, I'm very proud of. It took me about eight years to make, and uh, I know it's insane. It's uh, I know it's crazy. And I was going to what, what I wanted to do is I wanted to include cases from all around the world demonstrate the global nature of the phenomenon, right? And like, go to these locations, not just report on them from a book or from archival footage, but go to Africa and go to Australia. Really good cases like landing cases and alleged contact cases. And so I was putting this whole film together. Again, I was telling you, I went to China mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was gonna put Virginia in there as well. So I was going to, I was going to uh, Brazil and then, um, I just couldn't squeeze it in. I couldn't squeeze Virginia in. I didn't have enough. I, I wasn't quite there yet on the research. There were still some, some witnesses missing. And so the phenomenon came out without Virginia, this, uh, the, the Roswell of Brazil. And I contacted my counterparts in Brazil and they were devastated. Like, what happened? We worked on this for a decade. Like, what's, what's wrong with you? I said, 
ah, guys, I tried to squeeze it in. I only had like 12 minutes and there's so many, such a complex case and there's so many moving parts and there's witnesses that have yet to come forward that we need to still find. Ah, sorry, but you know, maybe we'll just have to do a film on it on its own. So the phenomenon comes out and the, and, and the thing about the phenomenon that I'm particularly proud of is that it's one of the first documentaries that really transcended the UFO community. It really did branch out into a much broader audience. And, and the reason being for that is we got some um, very well-known household names in the politicians. The former Senate Majority Leader, Harry Reid, he's huge. He's the one that got Obama to run for president. I had a very lengthy face-to-face uh, -face, on camera interview with him. The New York Times had just exploded that story on the front page about this secret Pentagon UFO program. They were, the DOD was admitting that UFOs were real. They couldn't explain them. The videos that were snuck out of the Pentagon and onto the front page of the New York Times, that was like getting traction. And the whole world was kind of like, geez, maybe this, maybe this is real. And I was kind of getting on the inside. I was working with some government insiders and it was, you know, people in the New York Times. I mean, it was, it was amazing. I never in my entire career anticipated being in that position and, and having that level of access and, and credibility and all of that stuff, right? So um, naturally, the, the next film would be kind of the phenomenon too, but I had some unsettled business. I had to get Virginia done. I had to get the, the Roswell of, of Brazil done. Now, I'll remind your audience, I have to report on what could be alleged live aliens walking through this town and being captured, okay? That's a tall order. That's a pretty crazy claim, okay? I'm aware of that. And it's pretty risky for my reputation. I've just worked with some government insiders. I covered some Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which I really felt I was pushing the envelope. I mean, we deal with a landing case in Africa with all those school children at Ariel School. Zimbabwe? Yeah. You know, just outside Harare. Yeah, and I, it's, I read about that. Yeah. About. So I report on that. I went to Africa. I worked with this guy, Randall Nickerson, on it. And, and he, he's got his own film on just that case, Ariel School phenomenon. But my film was touching on many cases around the world. But I'm dealing with a case. First of all, I'll remind your audience, I've got the former Senate Majority Leader, Harry Reid. He's very, very famous. I mean, he's very influential and famous in the United States. Well, what I didn't tell him, oh, and by the way, uh, the documentary that I'm featuring you in deals with a, you know, a UFO landing at a school in Africa and the occupants getting out and talking face-to-face -face or communicating face-to-face -face with aliens. Like... <laughs> He would be like, take me out of the movie. I was having nightmares, like take me out of the movie immediately, right? Um, but I did it in a way where I just allowed the children to sort of say what they, well, they, they, they gave on-camera statements right after it happened to a Harvard psychiatrist by the name of Dr. John Mack. And that archive footage is, is amazing. But the point I'm getting at is here is that when I finished that movie and I pushed the envelope to the, to the extreme limit is that it really did cross over into a more mainstream. I mean, I did interviews on every talk show and I mean, not just platforms like Rogan, but I was on Fox and CNN and all these different platforms. And it was, it was a huge risk, I thought, because I dealt with close encounters of the third kind. I reported on alleged close encounters of the third kind. And that's when witnesses claim to see occupants, right? Aliens, whatever you want to call them. So I know I'm getting going about this in a roundabout fashion. This is taking forever, but I wanted to talk about the relevance of... Yeah, but take your time. It's good to explain it. Okay, good. Yeah, because... No I'm rush. Talk, There's oh, no rush. Okay, good. Okay. The relevance of the Virginia case, because I had people that I'd worked with on the phenomenon pull me aside and say, are you sure you want to do this? Look at what you're sitting right now. You've got this incredible unprecedented position uh you know access dealing with government officials and and now you want to report on a ufo crash and live aliens walking through the town and getting picked up i mean are you sure that's what you want your name associated with mm. 
And I know what they were talking about. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a risk. But I said, yes, I, I stand behind this case. I really believe that something truly extraordinary took place. And so I went back to, uh, I went back to Brazil for a fifth time, and and uh, I was there for a little over a month, and uh, tracked down additional witnesses and put together this film, which was really the culmination of over ten years of work. And I gave credit to so many other researchers that had come before me in in Brazil, um, and I worked with people that had boots on the ground and and put out this film moment of contact people say what's it about it's like you should just watch it it's like you know because when you say what it's about people look at you sideways and they have this sort of incredulous look in their face but when you excuse me that's why joe rogan didn't have me on his show at first because it took like three or four people to tell him and you need to watch this movie because i'm telling you i know it sounds crazy but I think this happened. Like, you can't watch it and think it didn't happen. Sorry, I'm drinking my tea That's here. That's okay. But I'm, I'm surprised you even dismissed it, though, because normally the crazier the story is more likely to happen. I'm surprised you just totally dismissed it at the start, especially the work that you were doing because yeah, it was so out there. Why were you so scared? Was, was it your career? Extraordinary you were... claims require extraordinary evidence. I did not have extraordinary evidence. Mm -hmm. I do not have a photograph of that alien. Was there any photographs? We know that, yes, we know of multiple, well, we know of one photograph and we know of three different video sources, which I'm convinced at some point, and it could happen any day or it could happen next month or next year, that will be coming out. We're in touch with the people that, 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 that have it. That's the thing with me, because there's so much camera but, footage now and there's yeah. so much technology, yeah. there's never any clear-cut footage of someone walking or someone flying. It's all like old photos of the 80s and 90s. It's never concrete to go, there's definitely something here. Do you think people who maybe have that concrete evidence, we talk about guys like the men in black, is that a possibility of people in well, suits coming and taking things off people? Has that ever occurred? Well, that's, okay, so uh, let's back up about the evidence for a second. Mm -hmm. um, I can give a couple quick examples of photographic evidence that... Okay. Uh, People say, oh, there's never any good photographs. And I, I, I do admit that we would love to have more. However, let's go back to 1950. You've got McMinnville, Oregon. You've got two witnesses. Excuse me. You've got broad daylight photographs, multiple photographs taken by uh, Paul Trent. And a second witness was, was Evelyn Trent. And you can look up the Trent photos of 1950. McMinnville, Oregon. Fantastic. 60s. You can look up Santa Ana. Rex Heflin, there's, I think, four photographs of a disc-shaped craft, three, at least three, possibly four. A deck? Sorry? Would you say a deck? A deck? Would, what, what a shaped craft? A I thought you said a, I thought you said a <laughs> deck. <laughs> Flying dodo. <laughs> I no. thought you said a deck. Oh, my God. I thought, what a fucking, no. what kind of aliens is that? Yeah. So, That's the kind of craft I want to be on. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, so, uh, uh, and there have been uh, good photographs. Uh, I feature some of them, some of my pieces uh, out of the blue. I know what I saw. There's been photographic evidence every decade. Mm -hmm. Good ones. Yeah, mm -hmm. every decade. Um, I'll give, give you an example. Can we talk about the 1990 Calvine UFO case yep. that happened? Now, Calvine is in Scotland. It's yep. about two hours north of Edinburgh. But I, it's it's in the region of, and it starts with a P, and I can't remember that exactly. But it's the Calvine Peebles, sorry, P P F. It's a particular region. It's a highly sought. It's a beautiful countryside. I just went up there. Mm -hmm. So let's go. Let's talk about that for a second because we're talking about some photographic evidence. We could talk about you know, men in black and or wow. these men that show up. I report on that for the first time after twenty five years, just because I could no longer ignore that that's probably going on. But um, are, can, can you bring this photograph up? Yes. Or, or yes. You'll so bring this is up. a guy you met in Scotland. This guy will show the photo now of the clear, there was a clear yeah. footage of something flying in there. Yeah. So when I, I interviewed a gentleman named Nick Pope multiple times over the decades, Nick Pope investigated UFO reports in an official capacity for the Ministry of Defense from I think 91 to 94, something like that. And he was quite outspoken on the phenomenon that, hey, we're, we're dealing with something that's 
truly extraordinary. I think he would go as far as like, there doesn't appear to be a prosaic explanation. In some cases, we might be dealing with, you know, off world or something, but he was very conservative about how he went about it. But he said that we're dealing with something real. So I said to him years ago, well, you invested cases for the British government. Like, what are your top cases? And he said, Reynolds from Forest, 1980, December, it was a landing of an object that, that the officers came up and touched, crazy case, and Calvine, which happened in 1990. And he said, I said, tell me about this Calvine. He said, well, there were two hikers, and they, uh, it was August 1990, and they were um, hiking up on the hills in a little town called Calvine, C-A-L-V-I-N-E. And um, apparently they were illegally poaching, but that's a, another story altogether. They came upon a sort of disc or diamond-shaped object that was hovering about 200 feet, which would be, what, 70 meters, something like that, off the ground, totally silent, um, large, and they were they didn't know what they were looking at. I mean, they were they got some cover under a tree. They were kind of hiding out, freaked. What what is what is this thing? They really didn't make any sound, didn't have any air disturbance. And then a one or two Harrier jets came in and flew around it. At which point the guy, one of the witnesses, had a camera and he took a film camera and he took six shots of this object as the Harrier jet went round it. Moments later, the object, according to the two witnesses, accelerated from here and went straight up into the sky at an unearthly speed. And it never made any noise or caused any air disturbance and the jets were gone. Though they arranged to have the photographs taken to the local newspaper. The local newspaper was gonna run the story with the six photographs. They reached out to the MOD and the RAF for comment. Hey, we're going to run this story on this these guys that claim to see this thing, and and um, would you could you give us a comment? And it was, it was this guy. He was the uh, Royal Air Force press officer by the name of Craig Lindsay. And the reason why we know this is because this guy David Clark has an extensive research on this case. Thank you, David. David Lindsay says, "Well, how can I make a comment? I haven't seen the photograph. I haven't seen them." And the local paper says, we'll, we'll send you one of the prints. So they did send him this print. And it was August 1990. Sends the print off to this guy, Craig Lindsay. And he says, wow, okay, this is interesting. This is not your typical UFO report. Every time you hear a UFO report, you're always expecting like a little blobby, a little, a little white blob off of the, you know, uh-uh, this is a structured craft, broad daylight, points of reference, a military jet flying around it. I mean, this is exceptional. So he somehow the MO, so the RAF, so he starts to look into it. He contacts the Ministry of Defense. The Ministry of Defense steps in, tells Craig Lindsay at the RAF, hey, we got this. You can step down. And so at which point Craig Lindsay had already met with at least one of the witnesses and possibly both of the witnesses and interviewed them. Okay. So he got their account. He's got a photograph. So Craig Lindsay's now out, okay? Now the MOD steps in, and they get all the photographs. The story never goes to print, and the witnesses vanish. So I'd heard about that. To me, it seemed like a clear-cut story that it was covered up. And I said to Nick Pope, where are the photographs? He says, well, we had one of them blown up in this huge poster on the inside of the MOD office where we investigated UFO reports. I said, well, what happened to that? He kind of like shrugged his shoulders, I don't know, you know, and I harassed Nick for quite some time, probably the better part of two decades. And then again, thank you, David Clark, the research of David Clark finds the RAF officer, Craig Lindsay, this was just last year, Craig Lindsay happened to have kept that print for 33 years and out it came in a roundabout way. So now we have one of the six copies of the film footage, but we're looking for the witnesses to come forward again today, which is, it was August, 1990. And what are we now? Uh, August. 32 years ago. Uh, yeah. Aug years August, ago. 2023. Right. Are we? So, so I have, so, how, so if, if by chance 
any of these people are watching or they've told maybe well, their sons yes. by chance they know this story? How so, can they contact well, so, you? Or well, how do me, you go about that? There's a very specific thing I'd like to read, if I yeah, may, please. because it's it's really important that I get yeah, this yeah. right. And this came in from, well, you know, I might have to keep them anonymous. So let me, let me read this. Um, okay, here's what we know. And this is, we don't know this to be factual, everything I'm going to say here, but it's just, we, we think. Mm -hmm. Kevin Russell, it says care of Kevin Russell on the back of the photograph. I sent you one of the videos you can play yep. out and see it. On the back of the photograph, we don't think it was the original of the two witnesses. He was most likely a friend who acted as a middleman and took the images to the Scottish Daily Record. The two witnesses were illegally poaching and had taken pictures of their kill immediately before seeing the object. Source stated that the film reel showed their kill before the six images. Defense intelligence visited the two witnesses and colleagues stated that they were visibly shooken. One left the area to live with his mother on the west coast of Scotland. There were two Harrier jets caught in the six photographs. We're led to believe that one was RAF and the other was U.S. Marines. Again, we don't know for sure. No trace of these jets has been successful, certainly in the public eye. I brought this up with Nick Pope at the Ministry of Defense. He still restricted on what he can say, but this was just a couple of days ago. And Nick said to me, perhaps there's data missing in the official Ministry of Defense files that even himself was unable to get access to. In other words, they could have found those pilots, they could have given their testimony, and that could have been all classified. We don't know. Um, Source and Tillens found a very clever way to cover up the entire case. The MOD covered up the entire case. Some people say that it could be some super secret or, or radar reflector. Craig Lindsay, Nick Pope, don't believe that explanation, but we don't know for sure. So if anyone is out there, please, pretty please with sugar on top, even if you want to do it somewhat anonymously, you can find me on Twitter at at James C as in Charlie Fox at James C Fox. My feed is open. I'm tempted to give my email address out as well because I, if they don't want to find, go onto Twitter, but I'd have to say they can message me on Instagram. They or, can. Well, uh, well but James some, English too. They can message me on Twitter, Facebook. Um, I've got an email there where the team uh, watch as well. People can just click the email. Okay. Just think it for other options for yourself. I would turn myself into a pretzel to be able to meet those witnesses. Um, so please, if you're listening to this, please come forward. If anyone has any information on this case, please, pretty please with sugar on top, come forward. <laughs> it's a possibility it could happen though. You don't know who's watching or who's listening. Yeah, For I know. you to be here... Well, I, today in Scotland as well is a possibility. How do you how do you also separate who's a scam artist, who's got mental health, and who's possibly telling the truth? Great question. Great question. So I'll give you an example. With moment of contact, there wasn't one single witness in that entire film that came to us. We tracked them down. And the better the witness, the more compelling the case the less likely they'll ever want to talk about it. What it took, and that's one of the reasons why it took as long as it did, what it took to get those witnesses to come forward a moment of contact was ridiculous. Like, go back to the phenomenon, like the, the case that happened in, um, in Africa, right? Those children hadn't even told their husbands. I remember talking to one of them, uh, just use her first name, Emma, and um, with the help of, of Randall Nickerson, we tracked them down. This was in 2013 from all different corners of the world because the case happened in at aerial school uh, in 1994. And again, I said that there was a, a, a Harvard psychiatrist by the name of Dr. John Mack who flew in within a couple of weeks. He filmed all the children on camera and, um, and that archive material we had. But finding the witnesses 20 years later, bringing them all out, and one of them arrived, actually a couple of them had said this. I haven't even told my husband. I said, you had that incredible encounter and you didn't tell your husband that you have two kids with? He said, no. I said, why? Because I'm tired of defending it. So most of the cases 
that I have focused on. There's not people just coming to me, oh, I've got this great, you know, uh uh. It's us learning about a specific case, tracking down the witnesses, and then doing everything we can to convince them that we are not going to ridicule you. We're not going to make fun of you. We're going to provide you this credible platform. It might encourage other witnesses to come forward. So that's one of the biggest um, misconceptions. And a lot of what, what I do is that, that, that I just, like all these people are coming forward for their five minutes in the limelight. That's not the case. We're jumping, doing hands. Look, look what we're doing with Calvine. We're just trying to find the wit we're trying to find them because we want to hear what they saw coupled with, the photographic evidence. I want to talk to the RAF guy who talked to the witnesses. I want to talk to, you know, Nick Pope, who investigated at limited, limited capacity. So a lot of the cases that we cover, it's not easy just to get these people to come forward. It takes a lot of work. Do you believe a lot of people out there has got a lot of information but too scared to come forward because of the ridicule or potentially we talk about men in black coming and taking them? Well, we were talking earlier about um, we were talking earlier about you know UFO crash Roswell Brazil Roswell New Mexico right so it's like we covered Roswell in the phenomenon and I remember working with this guy who was a, a scientist Jacques Vallée and he would he was like are you sure you want to cover that case just 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 the facts in other words just the people who were there and what did they see, right? Because you're dealing with something potentially the biggest story ever of UFO crashes and bodies recovered, you know, and then I deal with it again in 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 Virginia, a crash and bodies recovered. I'm sure there are lots of other cases, obviously. And uh, I could never have predicted that they would have congressional hearings people testifying under oath in front of a congressional committee that we have programs within the United States government to crash retrieval of, of non-human intelligence objects and bodies. That just happened in the United States of America under oath. The highest level intelligence officers ever. I don't even know how many people even are aware of that. That is a big deal. So, yes, we're making these claims. Witnesses have been making these claims. People have written books. There have been stuff included in documentaries. Well, now we have, we have legislation. We have a push in the United States government for transparency on this topic, unlike we've ever seen before. And we have witnesses coming forward saying, yes, these government programs exist, special access, pro special access programs that are free from oversight of, of, of elected officials and that have been operating from dating back uh, 80 plus years. Isn't it crazy that there's a possibility well, that's, that is out there? I mean, for, so they've got their own team. How much then, trouble he would get in if, if you're going to testify under oath to members of Congress? And look, these guys aren't just saying, you know, hey, yeah, there's programs exist and we've got these materials. They're saying... This is the name of the program. This is the name of the location of the program, the lab that it's in. These are the names of the individuals involved with the program. And quite honestly, if you get me the clearance, I'll walk you in the door. That's happening right now. See about the thousands of people you've interviewed. Yes. I know a lot of people will say they've been abducted. Have you ever came across anyone like that who say they've been abducted and they've seen things and they've wiped their memory and they've seen the future? Because you'll see these cheap magazines, mm. you'll see these people at the front with a statue of an alien and say they've beat me up, Scotty. Yeah. Have you ever came across anyone who's been abducted? So I generally avoid, okay. So the first uh, 20 years, I covered just reports of strange objects uh, in our skies. And reports from pilots, reports from FAA officials, reports from uh, officials, uh, military people on the ground, civilians. And I'm talking either they're lying or, you know, they're reporting. So, so how do I say this? It's not like, you know, yeah, I saw this like uh, blurry light off in the distance and it was moving, you know. No, I don't report on that. I report on, yeah, I was sitting there with my entire family and this object that had a wingspan 
of over two miles, shaped like a big V, over two miles across, flew right over our house very slowly. It took five minutes to pass over, and we could see metal compartments and everything in the front, and it didn't make any sound. And had we not looked up, we wouldn't even know it was there. Those are the kind of reports that I follow, that I follow on, uh, report on. Um, Do you ever feel you could be missing a trick, just like Roswell in Brazil? You were late to the party, and somebody could actually have been abducted where they've got all this information. Well... In the process of doing all these, like, I can't not meet, I mean, I meet witnesses all the time, but I come across, like, I'll give an example. I Okay, so I, the reason why I was getting at this is because what I wanted to say was I covered just the reports of the UFOs that do not appear to have a prosaic conventional explanation, okay? Then I moved to uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Close Encounters of the Third Kind is a, is a coin Sorry, it's a phrase coined by the United States Air Force. This guy, he was a scientific advisor to Project Blue Book uh, named Dr. Jalen Hynek, and he categorized these sightings into first kind, second kind, and third kind. First kind is when someone sees a UFO up close. Second kind is when somebody sees a UFO up close and uh, it affects the environment around them, maybe burns someone's face or leaves marks on the ground or it's photographed or radar. Close encounter of the third kind is when the uh, witnesses report beings associated to the craft, right? So then I, for the first time ever in my career, I, I reported on uh, close encounters of the third kind. So people were saying, not just saw the craft, I saw beings associated with the craft. You can make up your own mind about that. Now, taken to a new level, then of course you've got the crashes, right? But then on, on top of that, now you've got these reports of people saying they're abducted. I've never reported on those cases. However, I have met with a couple of witnesses that I found very credible, one of which is uh, Travis Walton, Fire in the Sky. I think it was 1975, and there were like six or seven witnesses to a disc, Shapecraft. You could look it up, but that's I consider Travis Walton to be extremely credible who came in direct contact with with aliens. I believe that case. You could look, your audience could look that one up. Travis Walton, Fire in the Sky. There's another case that happened that I just happened to be sitting at a dinner table with. It was called the Allagash Four, and that happened in the 70s on the East Coast. That credible, multiple eyewitnesses, but that's pretty credible. Then, of course, you got Betty and Barney Hill. I think that was in the early 60s in New Hampshire. Um, that's, you know, thought to be pretty credible. And then, you know, you've got all these researchers like Dr. John Mack and, uh, and uh, who was that guy that wrote, I'll think of his name in a second, but um, who have done serious investigation into that, but I have not. So I, I can't speak intelligently on, on these abduction cases. And I think that, some, quite honestly, seem credible, and some seem uh, too out there for me. That's the ones I'd be right on. <laughs> <laughs> Just too out there, but, you know. Uh, so, like, what about the men in black, Jamesy? Like, is this a thing? Is it a myth? Because a lot of these movies, they seem far-fetched, but I believe a lot of them are actually telling the truth on a lot of things. A lot of these movies that get created now, 10, 20 years ago, I believe it's... Not telling you what's happening in the future, but I believe it's what's happening now. And I believe it, like you say, it puts people off with the fact, nah, too far fetched. But how do people come up with those ideas? You go back 3,000 years, 5,000 years, Egyptian times, and you'll see little flying saucers in, in the tombs and just how those drawings are there. So there's definitely something in it. But the men in black, is that a thing? Crash, like you spoke earlier, there's, they're picking up spaceships and covering it up. And is that. A, a thing with people try to cover it up. Somebody's got information, they'll shut them up or shut them down. Maybe I can give you a couple of cases Please that do. I didn't report on. Mm -hmm. um, why did I not report on them? Well, I was covering, I was, as part of the films that I was making, I came upon, I came across witnesses that talked about either they shot a photograph or a video or they were a major witness to an incident. And uh, these men showed up at their house and they were in dark suits 
and they were quite intimidating. Then they wanted to either take the evidence or they wanted to get them to, to say they they didn't see what they saw, that kind of thing. Uh, it just seemed too far-fetched to me. And, I, and it had a lot of baggage. I mean, one of the reasons why I think they use the word, the term unidentified aerial phenomena or unidentified anomalous phenomena, A, the word UFOs got baggage, right? You got the giggle factor. And B, I think it was probably a more correct um, description of the phenomenon because it's not just structured craft. There's other things associated with the phenomenon. So I think it was a more, but anyway, they're, they're, but when you say men in black, people get the giggle factor, right? It's like, oh yeah, they think of Will Smith. And, yeah. and so I avoided that. I had cases in, in, in the nineties. I had cases, shoot, I had cases, some respects in the fifties. Um, there was an, uh, do you want me to go into a couple of them? Of course. Okay, That's why you were here. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Sometimes I think I'm in a hurry and I'm just like, yeah, are you right, sure you guys want to go in all this? Your spaceship's waiting outside. I know, I know. <laughs> so, uh, I was investigating a little bit the 1950 McMinnville or McMinnville, Oregon case with, with Evelyn Trent and her husband, Paul. And, uh, this gentleman reached out to me after I had made an announcement about it on some TV thing I was doing. And he said, Hey, I interviewed Evelyn Trent and I've got the interview. If you like it, you can have it, you know, and he sent me some weird format and I had to get it converted, which I happily do. And I did. And on that interview, it was done in the eighties. So her sighting was 1950. They had a couple of photographs, great photographs. And her husband and her and her self were interviewed in the 80s. It might have been like 86. So what have that been? 36 years after the fact? And uh, she talked about these men, this man that showed up from an unknown government agency. He was in a suit, but not like a uniform. He ransacked her house. He was asking all these questions. She said, pulled the drawer. This is coming from her on camera. And um, so I heard about that. I thought, God, did they have this, this unknown government agency back in 19, you know, 50? And then I, I mentioned earlier the Rex Heflin photographs, that, that Rex Heflin, he was a road worker for uh, Orange County um, in California. It was like, I think it was like 60, 65 would be my guess on that case. And he talked about these men that came from some unknown agency. And they actually took his photographs and they vanished for decades. Um, um, but he talks about these men in, in suits that were intimidating and there was just something odd, very odd about them. So I'd heard about it then, didn't report on it. Then I heard about, uh, the U.S. had a, an amazing case in England, in the U.K., uh, Bendlesham Forest, R Rendlesham Forest Bentwaters, happened in December 1980. And I interviewed the deputy base commander, this guy, Colonel Charles Halt. And he described a plane that flew in, I think, from Germany, a uh, United States uh, Air Force plane that flew in from Germany within a day or two. And uh, some unknown government agency, and they subjected the witnesses to sodium penthol and took the photographs that, that Jim Pennison had allegedly taken. And basically just came in and kind of sanitized the whole situation. So I heard about, you know, that, didn't report on it. Um, I was investigating the, uh, the alleged, uh, well, the, the, the case that happened in 89, 90, 91 over Belgium. I interviewed Dr. Uh, General Wilfred de Brouwer, who uh, said that an unknown uh, U.S. government agent agency came in this guy in suits, and they they wanted copies of the radar tapes from the from the intercepts with the uh, jets to intercept this huge platform shaped craft that was the size of a football field that was hovering quietly throughout the night sky and shooting beams of light down. They intercepted F 16s I think it was, and De Brower told me, well, these men I don't know what agency they were from in the U.S., but they wanted copies of the radar tapes. And I said, well, sure, you can have them, but I need an official request. And they wouldn't do that. So they left. Um, so I'm, in, I'm just like, I'm hearing all these, right? I interviewed uh, a general from um, Parvis Jafari from Tehran, Iran, 1976, incredible encounter, fascinating encounter, visual confirmation, radar confirmation. And um, he's, you can look it up. You're, it's an it's a amazing case where they he did had a lock on this thing and then he 
thought he was going to try to shoot it. And Parviz Jafari said that his whole cockpit froze and almost like the, the object that he was going to shoot anticipated that move. And But he said there were men from the U.S. government the next morning down in their office in Tehran. This is 1976. It's like, really? Didn't report on that. Um, 1997, Phoenix, Arizona. I'm working with a woman named Frances Barwood, who was a councilwoman uh, that was quite outspoken. There was a, if your audience wants to Google January 3rd, uh, sorry, uh, March 13th, 1997, there's what's commonly called the Phoenix Lights, but it's actually a massive, there were a number of UFOs, but one in particular was a massive uh, boomerang-shaped object that even the governor that I interviewed, Fife Simonton, said it was two miles across. I mean, the thing, and it just very slowly floated over the city. It went from north, the north of Arizona to the south from like 7 to 9, 9.30 at night. Um, and I was investigating that case. I did investigated that case for a number of different films I worked on. And in the middle of the investigation, probably in the late 90s, probably in the late 90s, um, Frances Barwood and myself, she put her neck out and said, hey, we should launch an investigation. She was getting lampooned in the press. And um, uh, she was in touch with a witness that was a Vietnam vet. And he contacted her office and he said, hey, I've seen you, you know, you've said that we should launch an investigation. Uh, I'm a Vietnam vet. Uh, at the time, there was a, a comet called the Hell Bob Comet that was out under the night sky and people are out there going to see. So a lot more people witnessed this because they were trying to see Hellbog Comet. And this guy was on his roof with a camera and a tripod and he was going to film the Hellbog Comet coming over his house or up in the sky from his house. Sorry. And um, he said that he had a, uh, a scanner, like a CB scanner, so you could hear what the truckers were talking about. And there was an interstate, Interstate 10, that went between Tucson and, F and Phoenix. And he heard the truckers talking about a huge, that boomerang, massive UFO that I was telling you about. And it was headed right his way. So he filmed it with his tripod as it went right over the top of him. Great footage, according to him. So he calls, and I'm, I'm working on this whole case. I did two films with it. He calls Francis and he says, uh, hey, um, I understand you want to investigate this case. I, I shot footage. Would you like to see it? She said, well, yeah, sure. And so um, it made arrangements to drop it off at her office the next day. Well, that very same day, two men in black suits showed up at this guy's house and said, he said they were quite intimidating. And at that point, I think it was a couple months later, so it would have been March, April, it could have been May or June. And it's very hot in Phoenix at that time of year. And he said that they were wearing dark suits, which was odd. And uh, he said they were quite intimidating. And uh, they said they were from Francis Barwood's office, and we're here to pick up the footage. And he said he was actually quite relieved that's all they wanted. And so the only question they asked him is, did you make copies? He said no. And they took the footage and left. So he waits to hear from Francis, and he doesn't hear from her. So he calls her like a week later. And I'm in touch with Francis about this. And uh, he says, well, what'd you think? She said, well, I thought you were going to drop it off at my, my office. He said, well, I didn't need to. You had two people from your office show up and pick it up. She said, I didn't see anybody around. So I heard about, I heard about it then, and I didn't report on it, okay? Because I was like, this is just too nuts. And I could just go on. I could go on until tomorrow morning with these cases that I've heard, okay? But when I got to Brazil, and I met with the mother of the two daughters that came within 8 to 10 feet according to them, of a live being, creature, alien, whatever you want to call it. I mean, eight to 10 feet in broad daylight, three girls. And the mother said to me on camera, these men in dark suits showed up from, they were foreigners, I think she used the word foreigner. And they tried to bribe her and the daughters and say that, I thought, okay, okay. All right, these guys exist. This, this is real. This is real. And I said, I'm going to report on this. Screw it. And so I did. So I, for the first time, I went all in. And I reported on these men because I just couldn't ignore it anymore. I was like, okay, I've heard so many of these.
that this, this organization exists. In fact, when the secret Pentagon UFO program was on the front page of the New York Times called ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, Leslie Kane, Helene Cooper, and Ralph Blumenthal reported on this. It was a big story. The DOD eventually admitted the tapes were real. That was a big story. So the secret Pentagon UFO program was revealed on the front page of the New York Times. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, the government's been investigating UFOs this whole time. I said to myself, yeah, they have. And I know they have because I've been investigating and everywhere I go, they're there. So they never stopped investigating UFOs. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. But, you know, so I knew that there was an ongoing thing. Oh, sure, it might have different names or whatever, but there are some unknown, and I bet you, in fact, I'm sure of it, that 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 ATIP was just, you know, up here, but the real stuff's going on way down here. I guarantee you. Yeah. And they're taking evidence. They're, they're influencing witnesses. Um, this is ongoing, and I'm sure that the same organization, I'm sure they're still going about it today. Why are they keeping that hush-hush then? Why would it be a big top secret of other beings outside of Earth? Why do you feel as if they need to keep everybody silent? So I remember I, I met with a number of generals from different countries, but this one in particular stood out because he looked at me like, because I said, it was like, why would any like governing body, why would anybody cover up what could be the biggest discovery of our time? The question that we've all wanted to know, come on, look, look up at the stars at night and like, are we alone? You know, nobody believes that we're alone anymore. The question is, is it coming here? That's the question, right? Because people go, oh, when they find out what I do, they go, oh my gosh, yeah, I've never thought we were alone. You know, it's obviously there's life. And I say, well, yeah, I think that's the consensus now. And I think everyone will say, there's no way. Any statistician will tell you the odds of life is 100%. The question is, is it coming here? And I'm asking this general, because I was like, why would anybody cover that up? It's such a great, it'd be such an amazing thing to, to learn. Maybe that's why they're covering that up. Well, uh, so here's what he said to me. Kind of sat there, kind of shaking his head, like kind of almost like, you, you know, you naive young man that don't have uh, a clue on the lens that the military looks at this. Okay. I said, well, what's that? Okay, so imagine what we pay the Air Force to do, okay? We pay the Air Force to protect our skies. We pay the Air Force to secure our airspace, to, to keep us safe, right? Excuse me. If you have these objects that fly rings around our fastest jets, exhibiting a technology light years advanced than anything we have, they're not flying around, flying around on jet A fuel. Excuse me. You don't know where they come from, what they want, like what their agenda is. They fly rings around our fastest jets. How do you disclose that to the general public? You just say like, hey, uh, it's come to our attention that there are structured craft of unknown origin whizzing around with impunity. They're taking people out of their beds at night, not to say that's definitively happening. They're flying rings around our fastest jets. They're shutting our nukes off. They're all around, and we have no visible means of defense against them shall they turn to be hostile. We don't know who they are, or where they come from, what they want. So if you think about it through that, if you look at it through that lens, you know, it's justifiably, you could kind of say, okay, well, I see why the military would probably want to keep this quiet. I mean, if you look at the, the United States Air Force, the United States right now, they're being awfully, awfully quiet. Um, I guess it could give you some inkling as to a justification for secrecy. Yeah, There's got to be more to it than that, because if you go back to Egyptian times, like we spoke earlier, 3,000, yeah. 5,000 years ago, if they're light years ahead with their technology and got crafts that can fly through the air with no sound, then if they wanted to take anybody out, they'd have done it years ago. Oh, you, I agree you, with that. You know, they I agree have done with that. it years ago. Oh, I agree so with that. It's just... But if you don't know who it is, think about it. 
You're going to open up the floodgates with inquiries? Imagine if they came forward and said, all right, this is what we know. They're going to have to reveal all the things that they don't know. It's going to expose all their vulnerabilities and all the things they don't understand about it. Like, that's kind of a big deal. Are you going to answer some questions? Let's say they have the hardware, okay? How do you share that hardware with your friends without sharing it with your enemies? Think about if they've learned things from that hardware. Think of maybe they have. I don't know if they have or not. I would imagine they've learned something. I mean, if you could somehow harness that hardware and turn it into, again, like military uh, might, um, that could be the upper hand and, you know, power, control, influence, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So the people who already control the world, they could have more influence of making the world more wicked. Do they want to? Maybe they, I would love to think UFOs are here to give people knowledge and insight of how, how to have, live a better place. Do they want that technology in the hands of someone like Putin or, you know, some of our adversaries? Who knows? So while I totally disagree with it, I can, I have to say, I see some reasons for the secrecy. I don't agree with it. And everything that I've done has been pushing for transparency and answers. Maybe some of the answers are a little scary. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have, maybe the phenomenon has something to do with our existence. I'm not saying that's the case, but maybe it is. Is that a little scary? Would it impact organized religions? Would it affect our financial institutions? I mean, I remember meeting with Bigelow, this guy, Robert Bigelow. And he said a lot of like government contracts with the with um uh with 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 our government on investigating ufos um i think it was it was like osap that it went to atip there was something before that i can't remember the name of it but anyway you can look him up robert bigelow and um he's probably as an individual he's had think tanks uh scientific you know intellectual heavyweights that uh, nids i mean the guy's been He's put more money into research into the phenomenon than any other, probably any other civilian alive today. And he's had government contracts, so he's worked with government insiders as well. So I guess what I'm trying to say is the guy is clearly in a position to know what he's talking about, okay? And I met with him about 10 or 11, 12 years ago. And he kind of like, again, like the naive researcher that, you know, because what do I know? He's like, James... Do you understand the impact this story would have on society? Well, okay, we're not alone. Isn't that great? I think it would have a very unifying effect on all culture and religions, and I think it would unify us. I think it'd be amazing. And he just kind of laughed a little bit, and he looked at me, and he's like, we've done some research. I don't know if they researched that. Yeah, I think it, on the impact of disclosure, and he said that you take every scandal in the history of scandals, multiply that by a million. And he said that's the impact it would have if the truth came out. He talked about organized religion and financial institutions and all these things. Now, I'm not saying that I totally, what, what, I haven't looked into it to that level that I agree with it, but I can't ignore it or just completely uh, dismiss it because of who he is. He also said to me something that I've shared once or twice on a podcast. And again, I have to say this to your audience because people are going to go, James Fox is walking among us. And I'm not saying that. Why do you always feel as if you need to defend yourself? Because Fuck I, everybody else. <laughs> I have a level of access to Intel folks inside and I don't want to jeopardize that. Yeah, of course, you don't want to be a snatch. You know what I mean? If I start making like wild accusations and claims, and that could really names. jeopardize the 30 I years that, that I've worked so hard. But you've came this far. I have. And even if I take it back. I'm, I'm not saying that they're not. I'm just not saying that they yeah. are. I'm saying that he told me, I said, what do you mean they're walking among us? And he said, I mean, just that. I mean, if that's true, if, I'm just saying if that's true, mm -hmm. that's a big deal. Then, oh, well, he'll give you another example. You talk about the cover-up. You don't just look at what the phenomenon does. You, you look at what it doesn't do. 
all they'd have to do is hover over, you know, Glasgow for an hour or two, game over. Hover over the Macy's Day Parade, a football game. I mean, they've done that a little bit in Italy in the past. But nowadays, it would be game over. They don't do that. And you have to ask yourself, why don't they do that? How come they haven't overtly announced their presence? They've done some pretty, like, bold moves. You know, I could go into some cases where they've done some, like, whoa, okay. Please That's pr pretty bold. Well, like landing on a joint U.S.-British military base. Um, you know, this thing came down and landed and was in, sat on the ground for, like, 45 minutes. How do we also know that with the technology now and things looking kind of spaceshipy, cars, Tesla, do you know things are changing, materials are changing? How do you know that the government haven't created something as such as a UFO? Because people now talking about UFO invasions coming soon and to try and bring a one world order. Like you've got to stay open minded to everything. Even if UFOs do exist, can you imagine them looking down at Earth, seeing the destruction, religions, divide, oh, yeah, the divide and conquer, people killing each yeah, other, we can't the even wars, get the homelessness, we can't even get along the with destruction. Each other. Yeah. You'd actually, if the world was millions of galaxies and other planets out there, and and we're doing it all wrong down here, it, it make you sad to think that why are people hurting each other? Why have we got money that people are full of greed and full of hate and full yeah. of pain, suicide, addictions, so many much destruction. But they must come down here and think they're off their fucking head. Maybe that's why they come down, float around and go, fuck this, I'm back out of here. Yeah. Do you know, you know, because yeah. if people actually seen the bigger scale of the universe or what else actually out there, it would make them realise well, what are we fighting for down here? Everybody bleeds the same. Doesn't matter what religion you are, doesn't matter what colour you are or what age you are. We're human. You strip all that shit back. What are we? We're we're a good human beings. That like, humans are good when bad shit happens. We tend to want to go forward and help, and mm. that's the the beauty of it. But there's just so much divide, and we always talk about it: divide and conquer. People are divided; they're easier to control, and it's mad to think that what could be. I'd love to share with your audience a moment that I had with uh, Edgar Mitchell, who mm -hmm. was Apollo fourteen, and he said something so profound to me. It was just. First of all, I said to him, I've, I've shared this once or twice before, I said, what was it like, you know, we're in the middle of an interview about Roswell and UFOs, and I said, I'm really sorry, Dr. Mitchell, I, I know you've been asked this many times, but what was it like to go to the moon? <laughs> and uh, he said, well, James, he's very measured and calm, and well, James, if you really like to know, I'd be happy to tell you. I said, yes, I would. So he said that uh, when, they, when they left Earth, they had to do what's called a translunar injection. They'd go around the Earth, and then they had to fire the rockets, and then shut the rocket, get the trajectory just perfect, and then shut the rockets off, and then coast for three days, I think it was. If they got the trajectory off, they'd hit the moon and explode and die. Or they would ricochet off the moon and bounce off into space and gone forever, right? So it had to be absolutely perfect, apparently. But he said, he might as well have been in a simulator because he was so focused on the task at hand. He literally said, I didn't have time to reflect on what I was actually doing. And then when they got to the moon, they had to detach from the lunar orbiter uh, Michael Collins was in and... And, and go down and land. And he said, my job was to land the lunar module and get it, get it right, you know, and land. He landed, and he said he shut everything, all the systems off, and everything, he said that you, you never heard a quiet like this. You could hear these, like, macrometeorites pelting the skin of that fine paper, like, you know, craft. And NASA wanted them all to go to sleep because they'd basically been up for three straight days. So they tried, they jumped in their hammocks and they're trying to go to sleep, but they were so excited. They said, we can't sleep. Let's go and let's go walk on the moon. So they put their suits on and they go out there and he said, he's bouncing around on this, on this surface of the moon and he sees this, oh God, purple, uh, sorry, blue, white, like this marble, just elevate up above the lunar surface. And it was this beautiful marble 
object that came up and he said it was just, it was an earth rise. And it was, he said it was like an oasis in a vast darkness. Like he said, you don't understand darkness until you've been to space. Like the, 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 the vacuum of space and like the void of space. And he said, there was this oasis, this beautiful blue marble coming up. And he said it was the most magical, beautiful moment of his life. And he put out one glove and he held it out like that. And he blocked the entire earth with one hand. He said all the human race, all the cultures, all the, like everything that he'd always learned in his whole life. He, there were no lines. There were no borders. It was one race, one species. And it had this, just like, it, to go to space to see that, this deeply profound moving effect on his on his life from that moment onwards and i always think about that when i look at the moon i think about how fortunate i was to be able to talk to somebody who walked on the moon and had that epiphany had that vision saw it and felt it i mean it's one to talk about it but you see it you know what year did he go to the moon? 1972, I believe it was. Isn't it mad though? Because the, the footage from the footage from like, is it 1967 or 68 with Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong? Ni 1969, July. 1969. <clears throat> the footage looks so fake though. That's the only thing. That's my concern of why is people not at the moon now with better footage, better cameras, you know? Because there's talk about the boot as well with the, the marks under the boot was different and the flag moving and when the spaceship was going up, who was how was the camera moving up? A lot of there's. It's mad to think people think the world's round flat. The moon landers yeah. are real. The moon landers were fake because you've actually spoke to the person. Yeah. I can get why you believe. Yeah. Wow, blown away. Yeah, I was also friends with yeah. Faye Ann Potter, and who's who that? This, she's the sister of of Buzz Aldrin, who landed on the moon with Neil Armstrong, mm -hmm. and I was really good friends with her. What were she, they like? She shared photographs of the mission with me, their personal photographs that hadn't been released mm -hmm. with NASA. She had them on her wall in her house in Larkspur, California. And I met Buzz Aldrin on a, a number of occasions. And what I say to people, because people go, oh, we didn't go to the moon. My next door neighbor I was really good friends with, we didn't go to the moon, that's bullshit. And I say, show me one astronaut, one astronaut who came forward and said it was all a hoax. You won't find that. Show me one legitimate official NASA employee. There were thousands. Not one will come forward and tell you it was a hoax. So you mean to tell me that tens of thousands of people were in on that hoax? Now, I did bring this up with Edgar Mitchell about some of this shadows and shit of that nature. He said, James, it wouldn't surprise me. He didn't say this happened. It wouldn't surprise me if some things were shot, he said it was the most expensive effort in the history of mankind. We had Hasselblad cameras, no viewfinders, and we had gardening gloves on. And we're supposed to get the best footage that the entire world is going to be working on? Do you think that we we're going to come home empty-handed? He goes, it wouldn't, be it wouldn't surprise me if they had backup shots or something that they did. Not to say that that happened, but it wouldn't surprise me. Why is nobody being back out? when it came to Apollo 13, people didn't give a shit anymore. They didn't even pay attention to it. The only reason why Apollo 13 got any notoriety at all is because they almost perished out there. They were literally relaying like they'd done with Apollo 11 back to Earth. People had lost interest. Public support for the program that was incredibly uh, expensive waned significantly we would beat the russians we've done it mission accomplished it's a we have other resources that we could you know we have money that we need to focus on other terrestrial issues and public support just waned what about elon musk trying to get to mars do you think that's a possibility i do but he says that they have to figure out the 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 radiation exposure that's the biggest issue on how they're going to do that it's weight propulsion fuel food but the radiation exposure, I'm not a specialist, so I'm not the guy to talk to. Yeah, I'm, this, I'm not a specialist. Yeah. I can only watch a few videos and make my own assumptions. Yeah. Like, it's just when they're outside the space, mm. the camera never seems to do a 360. It's always looking down. And I think it's just, my, I don't have the answers. I'm not a scientist. Yeah. I don't know. I can only watch videos and you go, ah, it makes sense because the human mind, we're so busy and caught up in our own struggles in life. We forget to think what's out there. 
Is that true? Is that fake? Yeah. Is there other people out there? And it's a beautiful thing to think there's better life out there somewhere. Did you ever see uh, who, who's Boyakasha? Uh, 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 Ali G. Ali G. Yeah. Goes to interview Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> so <laughs> funny. And he goes, he's like, he's like, yo, yo. So it's like, you know, when we going to go to the sun? And he's like, well, actually, the uh, sun is extremely hot and it would burn up and we'll go during the winter. He's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like well, no, actually. He goes, well, we'll just go around the backside. He's like, mm -hmm. how do we know the moon is really, he was expecting to say, how do we, you know, how do we, how do we know we really went to the moon? And he said, how do we know the moon's really even there? <laughs> I was like, what? Mm -hmm. Anyway, he was so yeah. funny. Allergy is funny. Allergy was so yeah. funny. Oh he done my allergy gosh. and then Bora. And I think he done interviews with like David he Beckham. And huge just, in the United yeah, States. Yeah, massive. Was he huge here too? Oh, he's massive. Oh, yeah. He's funny. I don't think his films has been a bit shit lately, but back then it was it's the, the well, boldness. Fool, but Allergy couldn't fool anybody anymore because he know everybody knows who Allergy yeah, is, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But he was so funny. Mm -hmm. But also, I talked to some NASA officials about it because I brought it up. I'm always curious too. You've got to be. Yeah. Always got to keep an open mind to everything. And I brought it up and they're like, well, we have, uh, you can see things that we left with high powered telescopes apparently on the moon. There was a number of arguments, counter arguments that NASA officials had brought up to me because I brought it up. I mean, it was, people were really questioned. Like I said, my one of my best friends, my next door neighbor, my one of my best friends, like, we didn't go to the moon. That's bullshit. You know, not, and so I brought it up. Oh, give me the 10 strongest points. And I remember these NASA officials were like, because I was on a TV show called, uh, it was a stupid TV show I did for National Geographic. I'm terribly embarrassed to admit that I did it, but I did it. My mistake, uh, it was called Chasing UFOs. Ugh. And, uh, but I went, I got to go to uh, uh, um, the original room at NASA where the headquarters for the landing operations, I think it was Fort Lauderdale. Or was it Texas? I'm sorry, it might have been Texas. Why well, should I know this? I should know this stuff, Houston. Anyway, um, and so I talked to NASA officials and and they gave me some pretty irrefutable evidence as to we went we went to the moon. Yeah. What about the pyramids? Now, sorry? The, the pyramids in yeah. Egypt. We talk about millions of these big fucking bits Incredible. of cement just all aligned and there's little rooms and they're all to the centimeter yeah but there's pe people talk about that's from yeah other life out here who's then created that because it's in the same under some s certain stars at the north star their yeah. understanding of astronomy apparently yeah. was just unbelievable and, and the level of precision with the construction and due north and all this stuff like i'm learning about it i've had a fascinated with the sphinx and pyra pyramids at giza and i remember watching a documentary by john anthony west back in the 90s called mystery of the sphinx excuse me and i just relic weird artifacts that don't belong cave art um petroglyphs things of that nature that clearly depict what a modern day signing would be, what a camera would take a picture of. Do you know what I mean? Like when I was, I think there's an historical aspect to the phenomenon. I think it's been going on for forever. I think that I could be totally wrong and I don't know this. It's not my area of expertise, but I have seen extremely, I mean, I've, I've interviewed, I mean, I've researched the modern day phenomenon, right? So I have lots of comparisons. And when I see ancient cave art from 5,000 years ago, depicting the Wangina from the Aboriginals in, 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 in Australia, or different pe petroglyphs or carvings of, 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 of objects, I'm like, wow, that's very, quite similar to, you know, Dr. Jacques Vallée wrote a book called Wonders in the Sky. I recommend looking it up. It's just all photographs of all the inexplainable connections with the um, ancient civilizations that have talked about this. And the, the I'm watching this documentary series right now called uh, Ancient Apocalypse by a guy named, um, what's, what's, uh, he's a, he's not a, he's, he's, he calls himself a journalist. He's, he's been on, he worked with John Anthony West. I'm so sorry, I can't remember his name right now. He was on Joe Rogan. He's a big deal, but he put together this whole piece and he talks about exactly like, how do they do this? Look how big this was. These 50, uh, 50 ton or 200 ton stone blocks elevated with you know, super high off the ground with laser like precision and the due north aspect of it all. They had a profound you know, understanding of, 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 of the 
of, of astronomy back way back then. And the nature of erosion, they talked about this is fascinating stuff, but the nature of erosion was like, let's say water as opposed to wind and sand that would indicate that it wasn't built by the pharaohs. It was built, you know, so all these little things put together a very compelling story, in my opinion, that, you know, perhaps somebody else put, built these things. I'm not saying it wasn't us or it was us. I don't know, but it's, it's quite fascinating. And I've been looking into it, but that's not my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. What like, do you clearly. think of NASA? Do you think they're here for a good purpose or a bad purpose? Because they've got well, a lot of information. You know, they, a lot of people, they get whistleblowers from time to time, yeah. but they don't seem as if, they seem to cover up a lot more yeah. than what they should. Yeah, I think I think that they've been on the cover up too. I mean, I interviewed um, that very, uh, Gary, Gary McKinnon. Gary McKinnon, you guys can look him up. It was the biggest hack in... I think it was U.S. history at the time. I want to say late '90s, early 2000s. Gary McKinnon went on to a—I mean, he went to a number of DoD, uh, NSA, um, and he went into a NASA site based on some testimony from a whistleblower regarding um, optics of of satellite imagery of UFOs, things of that nature. And he was on NASA, and he came upon an incredible. He was he was in the process of downloading uh, a photograph on NASA's sites, but hidden from the general public, of a cylindrical shape, metallic, cigar-shaped metallic object with a little bubble on the top that was clearly taken from a satellite in space that he said it was just absolutely jaw-dropping. And then he got caught and he had men in suits show up at his house in England. And then he was facing 70 years in prison. Do you remember hearing about this? Yeah. Yeah, Gary McKinnon. You can look him up. Yeah, it's it's a crazy story. I just interviewed him because I've always wanted. But he gets into prison anyway, did he not? Not exactly. It was really tough. He's got limited, extreme limitations on where he can travel. But he faced seventy years in prison. He's Scottish. There was a oh, Scottish guy who done the he same. Was Scott. He was a Scottish guy. Yeah. Because yeah, I told yeah. him I'm here. I actually. I told him, him I'm here. I think it was his YouTube channel a couple of years ago to get him on. I told him I'm here, and he said, "I thought this was so beautiful." Oh my gosh. He said, please kiss the ground for me because he misses Scotland so much and he can't come here anymore mm -hmm. for now. But he he risked everything and, and I, I believe him. I absolutely believe him. And he said that there were, that he came upon photographs, one in particular, uh, that NASA was hiding from the people. So you asked me what I think about NASA. NASA, the head of NASA right now um, it was a former senator. He was in Senate Intel, uh, N N Nelson. Um, he has made some very compelling statements regarding UAP or UFOs in the last couple. Very compelling. But their investigation that, that they got started roughly a little over a year ago, they're supposed to make some announcements. We'll see what happens. I'm not holding my breath. Mm-hmm. So for anybody that's maybe watching and it's sitting on the fence of all this, what's the best thing they can watch or look up on to see, ah, okay, maybe there is, or anybody that's skeptical? I would say that I spent pretty much my whole adult life trying to put together the best evidence to make a case that we're dealing with something that defies a conventional explanation. Um, and I did a pretty good job putting that together for the phenomenon um, because, um, I mean, I spent, well, I tried it. I wanted to create a body of evidence that could be, uh, imagine being in a courtroom and you're presenting your case to a jury. Mm -hmm. So I thought about that when I put together the phenomenon, like, okay, let me put together some of the best archival cases, some of the best archival footage, some of the best archival photographic evidence, government documentation, and 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 tell the story, put the pieces of the puzzle together, tell the story in a compelling and comprehensive way. And it took me probably four previous films to get there. But I think with the phenomenon, we finally have a documentary that... puts the pieces of the puzzle together in a way that, you know, allows the audience to uh, to really make an informed decision on what they think is going on. 
I guess it's the best way I could say it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I'm not trying to ram down anyone's throat. Hey, ET's here. They've landed. I don't know. Could it be interdimensional? Could it be us coming back in the future? Hey, my my mind is open. I, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. The more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know still. Uh, and I'm extremely curious. The one thing I try to say is, myself included, as I suspend judgment, listen to the eyewitness testimony, and then draw your own conclusions. Because... Uh, how big are these aircraft supposed to be? Because you see so many different footages, so many different yeah. shapes and sizes. What? How big are they normally, and how many people could fit in them? I think there's no normally in this field. Mm -hmm. But the biggest one I ever heard, and I, and I remind your audience, I actually interviewed the governor, that's the president of a state, the governor of Arizona, Fife Simonton, who was also a witness. He saw it with his own eyes. He said the sheer size of this thing and the way it flew slowly and quietly, it floated shape, a mile to two miles across. Think about that. One to two miles across. I had eyewitnesses that said they would lie down on their front lawn in front of their homes and watch it on their backs float over them. They could see all these little compartments and metal this and like a floating city, some of them described it as. So that's one of the biggest uh, UFOs I've heard of. I, I interviewed some, a police department in Dublin, Texas. And the officers said they shot video footage of it. Of course, the local Air Force base got their hands on that. Um, they'll be coming out with that story. As soon as they leave the Dublin to police department, they're going to come, uh, the witnesses are going to come forward. But he said that, he said, James, this object was so big, it was like a floating department store. I mean, it was absolutely colossal. And it was floating there. I took my gun, my, sorry, I, I had a dash cam, and he said he rotated the dash cam up and filmed it, and simultaneously, there, all the police cars were stopped in the middle of the interstate, parked. He pulled out his um, radar gun, and he pointed his radar gun at it, and it was doing 22 miles an hour. He said it was like a floating city, and he had footage of it. That was the Dublin Police Department. So that's, those are two examples of some of the bigger cases, some of the bigger um, craft witnessed by very credible people. And then I've got some people that see things like little orbs that are the size of a golf ball. Mm -hmm. The Foo Fighters back in World War II, those were little Foo, Foo is fire, right? For French, Foo, and little balls of light that would fly around mm -hmm. and obviously uh, under intelligent control. So all shapes, all sizes, cigar shape. The case with um, the film I did, Moment of Contact, the alleged crash in uh, Virginia, Brazil, that object was the shape. Funny enough, it was very similar to what Gary McKinnon described, a cylindrical-shaped, metallic, cigar-shaped, cylindrical-shaped, metallic object about the size of a school bus, a, a big school bus, which I guess would be about the size of a small house, but cylindrical. See, when you see like, airplanes going missing with no wreckage, do you ever think, Possibly it could have been one case. Someone's beat me up kind of thing. One case. When they Valen talk about the what's that pyramid? Valentech, look it up. What's the pyramid when people things go missing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle. Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. Do you ever think well possibly it could be something that's took it? There's one case that is extremely alarming. And I I said this once before and somebody but I think it's out. I'm not gonna say where. But I heard Valentech. It's uh, it was in Australia, flying. Uh, I think it was early evening. Out of Australia, and they were flying over to. Is it Papua New Guinea? No, sorry, my geometry. I'm trying. It's my uh, geography. I'm trying to think. But in any case, you can look it up. 1970s Valentech. It was a young pilot in his 20s, and the the transmissions between him and the tower were recorded. And he describes an unknown object getting closer, getting closer, getting cl It's right over the top of me, getting closer. Then you hear a big metal clang, and he was never seen ever again. Uh, it's a pretty crazy case. It happened in Australia in the 70s. Valentech, you can look it up. And one of your documentaries, there was a aircraft apparently hovering in Australia. What's that one? Oh, it's a great case. 1966, Westall Primary School. 
uh, April 1966, and it was a landing, and it was witnessed by over 300 people, including the teachers. And I interviewed the science teacher, Sky Greenwood, and a bunch of the, um, yeah, that, that happened uh, broad daylight. Yeah. And there was a gentleman a couple days earlier by the name of James Kibble. He was an engineer. And he took a photograph of what could very likely be the object that landed at the school. Not, we, one can't say definitively, but it was very close, like just a few miles away, two days earlier. <clears throat> a lot of times when you have a sighting, like a mass sighting, there'll be, uh, there'll be sightings in the air, in and around the area for up to a week. So, mm. good case. Yeah, you want you wanted to speak about ICIG, so I don't want to yes. mess that. What is that? Yes. Okay. So I have a statement. This your audience should would like to hear. I mean, some of your audience, you have a more mainstream audience. Your audience probably doesn't really know a lot about the phenomenon about UFOs, yep. or maybe you guys are interested or not. But this this event that happened last month in the United States where you had open congressional hearings of Intel official David Grush, under oath, testifying that we have crashed materials in our possession. Some people uh, have criticized him, said, well, he's not a first-hand witness. He just came upon these programs during his investigation. He was doing his job. He gave all the uh, the, the details, uh, you know, that couldn't be revealed publicly uh, in a skiff, which is an, an environment that's closed off from the outside. And he could give the names, the locations, and the names of the programs, and all the explanations one could want. But there is an individual that is on the verge of of going public, and I thought that your audience might like to um, hear from this. Okay, here we go. Hello, James. This is the first-hand Intel guy, witness. Hello, James. It's been a while since we collaborated, collaborated on a public statement. As you know, I'm working to get private industry and Congress to collaborate on the UAP materials and biologics. Yes, both are part of the legacy program. I know we had a few oddball comments from folks who haven't been in the program, but as someone with first-hand knowledge and knowing other first-hand experiencers, we have been asked to formalize our testimony through the same ICIG, it's Intelligence Community Inspector General, process that David Grush went through. Unlike David, I personally have not experienced any attacks from the government, nor DOD. My reason for coming forward is purely to provide factual information concerning the people, locations, private laboratories, and research facilities that exist around the world in an effort to help the investigative process. It's always my hope that the DOD, Pentagon, and the Legacy Program people are allowed to get out from under the heavy-handed weaponization of the exotic technologies they have. I believe there is a solid path for everyone to come forward without reprisal and to help mankind by making the non-classified aspects more transparent and available for the sectors of our societies that involve medicine, energy production, and the enlightenment of our collective mindset as human beings. I'm encouraged by all the hard work that many unsung heroes are doing behind the scenes, and I can tell you there's a lot. Um as well as in the public domain. I will be coming forward when the time is right. I wish you and everyone you read this letter to all the blessings and goodwill they deserve. The truth is now being revealed, and I promise to continue doing my part. Anyway, that's someone who's not in a position to go public just yet, but is going through the process. Uh, there's, a, there's a particular process that they have to go through before they can become, I guess, whistleblower, right? So that was a message from one of those individuals that we'll be hearing from probably as early as this year. What would happen if you actually seen an alien or a UFO? Was that would that be your work complete, or is that a case of I'm only just beginning? What's the whole end product for you? If 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 as one, but what would you do if you actually seen it with your own eyes? Would it make sense then? Well, and you've not wasted thirty years, forty yeah. years. Um, well. 
You've not wasted it anyway. It's yeah, not to run down yeah. your work, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I already know the phenomenon's real. So it's not a question of do I need personal validation? Um, most people I know that claim, most are very credible, to have come face to face with a being from another world, it doesn't really help them along in life too well. You know, you're laughed at, ridiculed, nobody believes you. Um, it doesn't, it's not, it's not a career enhancing uh, story. So I don't think that anyone that I know, and I've met quite a few who uh, have had this type of experience and benefited in any way. I'll give you an example. I, one of the most well-documented close encounters of the third kind, and I remind your audience, it's when a witness reports an alien, basically, is uh, in the United States, uh, is uh, a case that happened in 1964 uh, in, the, uh, in the Socorro, New Mexico, and the, and the witness was a police officer on duty by the name of Lonnie Zamora. And... Lonnie reported this. The military got involved within an hour. There's, it's a super long story, but uh, the aspect of the craft was details were revealed, but the alleged encounter with the beans, that was something that the United States Air Force desperately pleaded with him. I know because I talked to his family and his coworkers. They wanted to downplay that aspect of the encounter because it's one thing to have um, an unknown object in the sky, right? Uh, it's another thing to have beans on the ground talking about. I mean, that's very difficult to give a prosaic explanation when you're looking into the eyes of an alien, right? And Lonnie's wife said to me, the witness, the police officer who was on duty, she said, uh, Lonnie was never the same after that. She's like, I don't know exactly what he saw, but he was never the same. He lost his job. He became worked at a at a at a at a, at a garbage uh, recycle or garbage site. He uh, he was ridiculed and laughed at. Uh, it was it was a horrible experience for him. He didn't benefit in any way. In fact, he he he. To wanted to completely isolate himself. He never went on speaking tour. He never, he gave, if he did give an interview, a handful of interviews in an entire lifetime, he said, don't ask me about the aliens that I saw. That, that, keep that apart, separate. He almost never talked about it. So when you ask me, like, uh, if I saw an alien, um, would that sort of put the whole thing to rest? Uh, I would say, based on the people that I've interviewed and met with, and in cases that I've investigated, it's uh, actually had a deleterious effect on their lives. Made it worse. You know, it made it worse, yeah, because who's going to believe you? Yeah. You know what I mean? First of all, you're just going to get laughed at. Mm -hmm. No one's going to believe you. You know, everything's a question. I like, because I remember when we interviewed military ex in Moment of Contact, and I'm looking in this guy's eyes, and I'm thinking to myself, this guy probably drove an alien around. Probably. And I was telling Joe Rogan about it. I said, uh, did, did, you, did you, I said, well, it wasn't, it didn't, it's been horrible for him. And Joe was like, why has it been horrible? The guy like got to see an alien and that's been horrible? So yeah, the guy's been having to look over his shoulder, the secrecy around it, like, you know, all this speculation about the case and everything that's going on and this guy's walking around with the biggest secret, he's harboring the weight of that on his shoulders. Can't talk about it with his family, can't talk about it with his friends. He's been threatened his life. He gets calls from the military base to remind him of his oath and not talk, you know, how you doing? Are you still living here? How are your kids? You know, like, keep your mouth shut, you know, kind of thing. And I could see that. I'm, in the movie, you're... We're filming him from the back, but I'm looking him dead square in the eyes. I could see the toll that that has taken on this gentleman's life. He hasn't benefited in any way, shape, or form. In fact, quite the contrary. So um, I get people, like I went to this expo uh, last week, and I 
I couldn't believe like how many people came up to me and gave me a hug and shook my hand. I was like so touched. Like what? They said you're you're the one per you're one of very few people that we can come to and talk to and tell what we experience and we know that you're not going to laugh at us, you know. And so it's it's not. Uh, I don't think that anybody benefits really that I can think of yeah. from from seeing that, mm -hmm. unless it you know I guess it came out uh, and was officially acknowledged by by governments from around the world. And um, if you want, we can talk about the, the the politics of disclosure a bit because that's something that I'm going to be covering mm -hmm. in my new movie. Because I I used to think it's something super simple. Sorry if I'm like, like okay, excuse me. Um, let me get a glass, sip of water. I used to think like it would be simple, like the government, like the president of the United States. Mm. We have literally a section in our upcoming movie called mm -hmm. the politics of disclosure. And I used to think for decades that the president of the United States would come forward and step at the podium and say, my fellow Americans, it has been brought to my attention that this is going on, blah, blah, blah. Right. And then I started thinking about it. The president of any country, it's probably hated by half the population, right? Mm -hmm. So then it's like this politicized thing. So then the president's going to make this huge announcement. And then the president, what is he going to like have access to? Are they going to, if you, if you make that kind of statement, you better have proof to back it up. Are the Intel folks going to produce everything they've got? Um, is it, it's not a job for Congress. It's not a job for people in the Senate or, or, or the House in the United States. Certainly, it's not their job, right? So is it a job for the United Nations? Is it a panel of international scientists? Well, if that's the case, then they're going to have to produce definitive proof, right? Let's see the craft. Let's see the bodies. What do you got? You better show me more than a photograph. So now, suddenly, these intel folks are gonna to have to produce the evidence they've got. They've got means and ways as well, right? You got killer satellite photography over Iraq and you've got, you know, whatever, or wherever you are, you're gonna reveal the, the means and ways. But now they're gonna to have to share, how are you gonna announce that you have it, not show it? And how are you gonna show it to your friends without sharing it with your enemies? We're gonna keep that from the rest of the world? I know it seems like this easy thing, but Honestly, it's very, it's a, uh, it's almost impossible. Like I'm interviewing this guy, talking with this with this guy right now, who, uh, who said to me that the Bush Jr. administration, President Bush, the one that took us to war in Iraq, that administration, not his father, and uh, apparently he convened a panel to disclose this whole story. I don't know how long this panel was convened for, whether it was a year or whether it was two, but he said that they, they came back and realized it couldn't be done. I said, well, what do you mean it couldn't be done? And they were like, well, think about it. If you start going down the different avenues of, all right, let's try this, that doesn't really work. You try going down, how, does it, how do you do it? And then you've got America, which represents such a small percentage of the world population. We're gonna tell the rest of the world that we're not alone. Hey, guess what, world? to the other 97% of you, we, you know what I mean? Like, do you get in touch with other world leaders? What do they know? Like, what does Russia have? What does China have? Like, I, I don't know, man. I don't know how they're, I don't know how they're gonna do it. I really don't, but it's not easy. What about Antarctica? I, don't, I know people... now that I've heard about it. I know Linda Moulton Howe is, is deeply into that. Uh, I personally have never met any witnesses from I never heard any credible testimony of underground bases there. It would certainly be a great spot if there were, mm -hmm. but um, I, I just could open my mouth and I wouldn't have anything intelligent to say. But I, but I will say this: I was doing this, uh, you know, after after the phenomenon came out in uh, twenty, shoot, it was the end of twenty twenty, so there was almost twenty twenty one. It was like kind of the film of twenty twenty one during the pandemic. Everyone was like. Ah, aliens ufos you know it's probably one of the reasons why it was as successful as it was everyone's locked up in their houses watching aliens right mm -hmm. but uh um 
I was putting together this uh, thing called the UAP uh, Transparency uh, Act or something. Basically what it was was, hey, let's get everybody to sign a petition. We're going to talk about what we now know, what's happening behind the scenes, and see if we can get people to sign on and, and, and encourage our government uh, officials to uh, support transparency on the topic. And I was working with this Intel guy, and he goes, hold on a second. Mm. No, to ch change that language. I said, why? Well, uh, maybe they might be living in our oceans. I said, excuse me? He's like, well, just change it. Because, you know, because then it's just, if you, if you leave it this way, then then all the possibilities are still on the table. I said, wait a minute, hang on a second. Do you know something that I don't? And that was the end of it. But this individual is pretty damn you know, it was just me and him. I thought, you know, and then you have reports from David Fravor and other people of these things coming in and out. I don't know. So you ask me about Antarctica, I know nothing. You ask me about oceans, I've heard credible reports from people in submarines, people in the Navy saying there are things in our oceans that we cannot explain. No question. Because we've only, we've only, we've not, was 80% or something. The Huge. waters we've never, yeah. we've never seen or never... Like even big, big, yeah and they come apparently they come out of the water almost as quickly as they go in it's almost like it's almost like the two different atmospheres or something don't really don't affect the propulsion of the craft or something they go in and out like it's nothing well I, i'm not a witness yeah. but that's what i've heard so if someone sees an unknown object mm. surely there's there's radars surely there's people in towers who can track to see if there's been objects in that area there must be something logged in to say okay there was a, a, an object here we don't really know what it was but it's went away in this speed or is the unknown objects ufos un fly under the radar how does it work is anybody ever so there's you know, a very famous spoke to pilots and stuff yeah that must come on the radar that there's some oh, I have no objects question. there so i'll give you an example that i know about and that's the Nimitz, Nimitz case. And it happened in 2004 off the coast of San Diego, about 200 miles off the coast. Uh, David Fravor, there was that one uh, female pilot, Kit, 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 Rich, I have to look up her name. Uh, um, they said that they had radar data. There, there are, there are people in the, in the, on the ships were picking up objects that were going from uh, 80,000 feet and 80,000 feet is basically space, I guess. And it would go from 80,000 feet down to sea level in the blink of an eye. And this was going on for if days, if not weeks. And finally, I guess they got enough, they got a report of some things on the radar. And that's when the it now infamous encounter with the Tic Tac with David Fravor, the pilot of the Navy. And David Fravor is, is asked to go and intercept, go and investigate this whole thing. And this dramatic encounter with this tic tac shaped object, you know, lasts for several minutes. And um, I, I, I guess they go and uh, David Fravor has this incredible cat and mouse with this thing. Uh, it's all out there. And then he lands and then somebody else goes up and he manages to film this object, I guess with FLIR, forward uh, infrared, what does the flare stand for? I remember. <laughs> but it's basically uh, heat signatures, right? So it's picking up this like tic tac, and that's the now infamous tic tac shaped white object that shoots off to the side. Well, those tapes, uh, that footage of the tic tac was walked out of the Pentagon and onto the front page of the New York Times. And that's probably why you and I are even having this conversation right now. But apparently, the logs and the radar, the, the radar tapes, of all of this during that window are all gone and nobody knows what happened to those. So the log books and the radar would, could give us so much more information, right? But they're all, it's all gone. So there's, you know, there's, a, there's, there's unfortunately an effort to, um, to cover this stuff up just like Calvin. Calvine UFO photograph disappeared, six of them, and the witnesses, because that case is incredibly compelling. You've got six photographs, broad daylight, 
with a Harrier jet and two witnesses and points of reference. That's rare. And it's on film. So you can study the, you know, you can do the analysis from, from the negatives. Does your life ever become in danger? You know, I think the only time, in my opinion, the only time, I mean, look, there's no question that I've been, I, at the very least, monitoring what I'm up to. No question about that. Um, but the only time I would be concerned is if, let's just say, uh, I went to Brazil again, which I'll probably be doing at some point, and I did manage to get my hands on the videotaped evidence of the creature that was in captivity at Humanitas Hospital, or maybe at the military base Eza or Campinas, um, I would be legitimately concerned for my for my safety until I could get... And I've thought about that. Like, what would I do? Let's say I make the deal, and I've been in negotiations with a number of different people for about a year now. Um, how do I actually execute that? Do I bring cash? What, you're going to give me the footage before you get the cash? Do I give you the cash first, then I get the footage? Now I've got the footage. You've got the cash. I'm in the depths of, of, of Brazil, and now i got to get out of Brazil. Well, what happens if the government gets wind? I mean, the government, I mean, the military base was already making phone calls to people that we had just met with or we were about to meet with. So they're hip to what I'm doing. I'm not hiding it. I'm down there in, interviewing people in the streets. I'm interviewing the mayor, right? It's no secret I'm down there doing what I'm doing. But let's just say that I did have that footage, okay? I have, whether, whatever, put, suspend judgment for a moment. If I had video of a flipping alien, Okay, in my position, it was shot by military, that I bought off a military witness, and I'm trying to sneak that out of the country, I would be legitimately concerned for my safety. Absolutely, yes. Now, I thought about, like, when that day comes, and I think it will, how do I do it? It's probably going to be on an older format, right? Unless I get them to digitize it, it'll be on an old format from the 90s, right? Do I upload it to a server? Can I upload it from a server? Do I need to go to some place? Like, how do I physically get that out of the state, out of the country of Brazil and back to the United States? That's, that's something that, you know, that worries me a little bit. Yeah. It seems easy, right? I'll just go meet with, but people don't realize that the witnesses are terrified Witnesses that just want to talk about what they saw are terrified. Now imagine if you got video evidence of of that creature, that alien, that being, whatever you want to call it. You know, that would be reason for concern. No question about it. No question about it. Could aliens be living among us now? Yes. They could be. In human form, just in a disguise and another... I've met... I've met a number of very credible people that have told me that's the case. I don't just believe it because somebody told me. I haven't seen one that I know of. And uh, but if it were true, that's a, that would be pretty crazy. But I have brought it up. I've heard it firsthand from military folks. Military folks. I'll say that again. Military folks deep on the inside have told me this. Not one, not two, but probably more than that, three or four. And then I've met with some people that I trust, and I've said, hey, I've heard this account, and I've heard that account. Do you believe that? Could be true. And it's kind of like a little nod, <laughs> like, like they barely even want to say anything, kind of like, yeah, could be. So I have not, like you said, I have to keep an open mind. And yeah. I can't just dismiss something because I find it to be outrageously unbelievable. And that does sound that way. And I could imagine that your audience say, this guy, James Fox, just lost me because he's saying now that there are aliens walking among us. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I've heard very compelling accounts from credible witnesses, some in the military, that have seen them and came face to face with them. And they've told me that. I can't, just like my men in black, it took me like 20 years to come around. I'm in the coming round process on that. I, I I think you'd be surprised at the amount of people actually think like that. That there is people yeah. among us. If you actually look up to the sky, you yeah. just if you're yeah. not asking that question, there's something else out there. Then 
You're fucking two bits of a life. Like, You've just got to be very different from asking the question: Are we alone in the universe? To are they walking among us? Yeah, but I feel as if we're at that stage now where <clears throat> something's not quite right. Hopefully, they're here if they are for a good reason, yeah, it's and like, it's to try and guide and help and make life better. But right now, the the world seems a bit in turmoil. Yeah. Seems a bit messy. Definitely seems like a turning point. That's for sure. I mean, it's interesting that all these things coming to a head. Uh, in uh, on on planet Earth right now, and yet paralleling all that is this unprecedented push for transparency and and transparency on a story that could possibly change the course of history. That could possibly be a paradigm shifting story. It's like I've said this countless times on this podcast. If any of this is true. It's the biggest story of modern history. I personally feel, and I and I know that a lot of people would agree with me on this, that it would have that similar effect that Edgar Mitchell felt on the moon when he looked back at planet Earth as this little blue marble suspended in a vacuum of deep space and this oasis of life, all one race, one species, you know, no borders, no, um, no differences, just, you know, one people just equal and i really i really believe that 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 this story would have that similar effect on us i really do and i've said that for decades why do you think we're here humans i have no idea we're not here to fight and kill each other i'll tell you that much yeah definitely not where do you go forward for the future then james the boy well so uh it's interesting i'm so i'm doing a documentary right now i'm about 80 percent of it's shot I say shot, it is, it's captured on camera. I'm going back to D.C. in about a week. And I want to put a laser-like focus on where the evidence is and who has the authority to release it. I want to talk about the politics of disclosure. I want to talk about what's gone down between 2017 and today, because there's a lot of stuff that's gone down. And, and, and yeah, the politics of disclosure. And then, um, you know... Hopefully I can like focus on other things that I have interest in life. <laughs> I'm not just interested in UFOs. I'm raising a kid. I have a, I have a nine year old that I love him dearly. And uh, uh, I live out in the country and on the East coast of, of America. And, and uh, I love hiking and biking and swimming and, you know, all the things. Mm -hmm. And I love doing those with my son. Uh, so, uh, but I have to, Strike while the iron's hot. So I'm staying focused on this topic. It's it's never been more, I think, relevant and and um, point of focus. Like something something's happening. Something big is happening, and anyone who's paying attention can tell you that this is this is unprecedented. What's happening? And um, I think sit tight mm -hmm. because you look at babies and kids. It's the most precious thing on the planet. Oh, my gosh. So why do we stay so focused on work or business when really should we be focused on the kids to then... Because nothing else matters. Who gives a fuck if somebody was on the moon or there's aliens or whatever? When you're with your your child, that's life. Yeah. That's complete. Nothing else matters. Oh. <sighs> yeah, I know. I, I think about... Why do you do it then? Well, I just think about... Well... No question about it. I'll give you an example. This is the most beautiful moment in the last 10 years of my life. I was riding my son. So I uh, lived in a small town. I've moved since then, but at the time, and it was, like, you know, like a couple miles to my son's school, and it would be a great way for me in the morning to get some exercise. So I would throw my son in this little seat that I had on the front handlebars, you know, and he put his little helmet on, and he was young. And we'd ride the bicycle together, no electric. It was just all manual, right? And I'd get a nice workout. And um, and I'm, I'm wrapping up the phenomenon, you know, which was, was a colossal, like the last 10% of getting a film across the finishing line actually is extremely challenging. There's so many things you have to do. Lawyers have to sign off on, 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 um, you know, Ian Aaron emissions insurance and color correction and sound design and, you know, just 
just so much stuff that I'm dealing with, right? It was an exciting moment, but it was like, I, was, I had all this stuff in my mind, and I'm racing my son to school, and he's like three, and, uh, and I was late, and I had these phone calls. Get to the top of this hill, and we're coming through this little forested area, and there was a bench overlooking this beautiful meadow and this these trees, and my son says, Daddy, can we stop and look at the nature? And I thought, Yes, we're going to do that. We're going to stop. I'm going to put all my troubles to one side right now, and I'm going to forget about all the calls I've got scheduled, everything. I don't care. Stopped my bicycle, came to the bench, just the two of us, and we sat on the bench together, and he put his hand on my hand. Oh, and we just held hands, and we listened to the birds for like 15 minutes, late for everything, right? It was like, wow, that's what life's about. That's it. But yeah, I'm the same. It was so yeah. beautiful. Thank God I stopped because I didn't want to. For a moment, you know, like oh, I got to get on the phone. Mm -hmm. I got to do this. I got all this stuff I got to do. <laughs> it's mad though. But I just sat there and held yeah. my son's hand, and it was the most beautiful moment of his childhood. That moment right there. Because how many times would you have wished to have done that with your dad? Yeah. And then I'm the same. I'm a work course. Yeah. I want to be the biggest, the best. But when you break it all down, when you take that away. Who the fuck am I? I know I'm a good dad, so I feel as if those moments with your kids, because we're so caught up on our phone, trying to find yeah. the next spot, trying to find the next interview, you're trying to find yeah. the next fucking lead to a potential Absolutely. UFO or alien. Oh my gosh, take yeah. all that bullshit yeah, away. Yeah, take yeah. away the podcast. Take away UFOs. What have we got? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You, but I also, the reality is, I'm not independently wealthy. Mm -hmm. I've been hustling. I've been Same. so broke during times of my production that I've gone out under the night sky and prayed to whoever's out there. E.T. Whoever. Like, I need help. I'm done. I'm tapped out. I can't do this. And miracles would happen. I had a guy named Joe Bellotti. I just thanked him. Unfortunately, he passed. I thanked his daughter. I never met this guy. He sent me a letter with this was like a few weeks after i i'm not kidding you when i tell you i went out into the night sky and i prayed i did i was i was so financially i just i didn't i didn't have my parents didn't have any money i couldn't i was on my own couldn't turn and can i can you get a no that wasn't even on the table this guy joe Velotti contacts me and uh he sends me a letter along with a broken vhs tape tells you how long ago this was and he says dear sir uh uh, I bought your, I, I found out about your movie and I bought your movie and I got the VHS. Unfortunately, it arrived broken. Would you mind giving me a new one? And uh, I said, my gosh, I felt terrible. I, I wrote him a letter. Then I said, dear sir, I'm terribly sorry for the inconvenience. Here's your money back. Here's your postage back. Here's not one, but two copies of my movie for to pass the one along for the friend. I'm so sorry for the inconvenience. Thank you so much for your support. You know, James. And my my partner at the time, she was like, you're so poor, you can't afford to be giving stuff away. I said, Shh, just, I'm treating this guy like I'd want to be treated. No, just stop it. Two weeks later, he sent me a check for $20,000. And that check made got well in, in the works of making a film I called Out of the Blue. It sent me to Russia. It did all this stuff. It, I, I tell you, mate, if I didn't, if that didn't happen, I don't know what I was going to do. But just to say, like, you know, I don't have the luxury, even now with this, the success that I've had, I'm, I can't stop. I mean, it's all I know how to do. I got to, I got to make money somehow. You've got to put food on the table. And I love doing what I do, and I never did it for the money. But I'm a dad. I have a mortgage. I have a son. I have a partner. I got to, so I got to contribute. I mean, you know, got to keep moving. Yeah, of course. I get to understand the same. You know what I'm, I'm saying? I'm the same. Listen, yeah. I, I, but I, I know what the most beautiful and precious I, thing is, and yet, absolutely, I take it away, and I don't want to lose twenty years of looking back. Yeah. Hopefully I'm not in my fucking deathbed in 20 years, but 50 years and I look back and think, yeah. oh, you've just slowed down a bit. Yeah. Get off your phone, enjoyed, like you say, that 15 yeah. minutes. Yes. That's it. That so bliss and happiness isn't a 24 7 thing, yeah. but it is a thing. And it is a thing you can have every day. And that's where 
we don't stop because I want to give my kids a life that I never had an opportunity. So it is difficult to try and find balance, mm. but I'm not stupid towards trying to be this end product for what? Because then I've missed that thing that was free and that's family time. Yeah. That's fucking just sitting with nothing mm-hmm. on a on a park bench or feeding squirrels or whatever it is. Because that's the beauty of it. And if you can just sit in that present moment and yeah. enjoy that then because all we have is memories. That's yeah. what we take with us. My 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 father was thinking that he had a year to live pretty much all my uh childhood. I mean he, he sorry, he was given like a year to live when he was 26 he might have been 27 26 27 and so in retrospect i think back at the time i had with my father was so special we always did just we just hung out and did cool stuff whatever we could do it was so magical and in retrospect i realized he probably thought i could be dead next year you know i'm going to take this time and i'm going to really do fun stuff with my kids and he did and we did i have such fun memories so fortunate and you know even if you're lucky to live to the ripe old age of whatever that is i talk to a lot of people that are in their 80s and 90s they say you blink and it's over like it just you know i recognize that and i also i think having a father that was you know that was ill uh at a very early age in his 20s um i don't I know that it can happen to any of us at any time, no matter how young you are, no matter how healthy you are. Don't ever take that for granted. Mm-hmm. Your mobility for granted, your health for granted. That's all we have. Yeah. James, your boy, give me a whole rundown oh. before we finish up. Give me a whole rundown in the 30 years work that you've done on UFOs. Yes. Just give me a rundown on it. What do you think they are? Are they here? Just give me all the work that you've done, which has. So I did a I did a film, which in the nineties called you you want is this what you want like, yeah just uh, give me my yeah, yeah yeah so I did a film called uh, UFOs Fifty Years of Denial sold to Discovery Channel, mm-hmm. um, that got me an invitation to Russia. I met with generals and military guys in Russia. I went to Star City. I met with a cosmonaut Pavel Popovich. Um, that ended up becoming. I met with a Mercury astronaut, Gordon Cooper, who talked about a landing case that happened at Edwards Air Force Base that was filmed. That footage, of course, was sent to uh, the Pentagon or wherever and never seen the light of day. Um, I did a second version when I wasn't happy with the first version of Out of the Blue. Every time you finish a project, it's like, you know, you're usually penniless and everyone's been worked so hard that when do you know you're done, right? Do you look at it and go, oh, I'm fully satisfied. This is the masterpiece I wanted to create. Or usually you're out of money and everyone's exhausted. It's like, okay, we're just going to put this thing out. And I've made those compromises many times. Um, then I did another version of Out of the Blue called The Director's Cut. I spent a couple of years on that. Still wasn't quite satisfied. Then I did, um, I know what I saw based on an event I did at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., where I had 14 military and government officials fly in from seven countries with a woman named Leslie Kane, who's been a contributing editor to the New York Times. She broke that story about the secret Pentagon UFO program in 2017. Uh, I made a movie about that event called I Know What I Saw. I sold that as a two-part series to History Channel. I then took some time off. I did a film on the BP oil spill called Pretty Slick. Boy, we'll talk about apocalyptic view. I flew in a seaplane over that area that was bubbling up, oil and on fire. The oceans were on fire. Dead stuff flying up. In the It was apocalyptic. So I did a film called Pretty Slick. I then got back into UFOs. I mean, I was always into it, but I got back into UFOs. Oh, I did a silly TV show during that time. Oh, God. I have no one to blame but myself. But uh, did, that was a six-part series or something. I traveled around. I met an amazing guy who's now my DP uh, named David West. Um then I did The Phenomenon, and that took me about eight years. And um, and then I went and I did Moment of Contact. And on and off, that was about 10 years, on and off. And then now I'm, I'm doing a, a documentary, uh, trying to put this, like, where we are now. Where, do, where, where, what's happening right now? How did we get here? I'm not doing a bunch of history. 
I'll probably start in 2017 and up to modern day, all the things that are going, going on behind the scenes, all the um, legislation that's been going on and where's the evidence and who has the authority to release it. That's kind of like where I'm at right now. If UFOs and aliens exist, where do they live? I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't think, honestly, I don't, I don't, I don't think anybody knows. Could I be wrong? I could be, but most of the government insiders that I've met with, they're like, oh yeah, the phenomenon's real. We're not alone. They're, they're here. We just don't know much more than that. Like we could be ants to them or we could be their experiment or we could be a Petri dish or we could be them or we could be, tra they could be travelers from the future. I mean, there's so many possibilities. I just don't know. I would like to know. I would. Same. I would love to know. But there's something going on, and that's real. And it's under intelligent control, and there's a technology behind it. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you that. With all the work you've done, all the films you've made, documentaries, all the interviews you've done, you've traveled around the world asking the questions. Yeah. Are UFOs and aliens real? Oh, 100. I put my life on it. No question. It's just, what exactly are they? The, the, if you look at the testimony from David Grush, he says non-human intelligence. And the reason why he says that, not because he doesn't believe that we're being visited by extraterrestrials. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. But he says non-human intelligence because what happens, to, what happens if they live around us? What happens if they live among us? What happens if they live under our oceans? What happens if they're interdimensional? They're around us at all times. There are so many different possibilities. What if it's us from the future? I don't know. Non-human intelligence seems to be the most um, neutral and safe way to encompass the entire phenomenon in a way that um, reflects most accurately what, what's, what's going on. What do you think humans are? I think I asked that earlier, but what do you think we are? I think we're self-absorbed, destructive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Perfect way to go. James, the boy, listen, for, for being here and coming, giving me your time, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I've watched your work. I think it's unbelievable. I genuinely wish you nothing but the best for the future. You're a good guy, good heart, clean soul. I like that. I hope you get all the work and get all the answers that you deserve. Hopefully you keep doing what you're doing and, and just fucking try to get I don't know what it is you're searching for. We're all searching, I guess. Even if you did find the answers, would you stop? I don't think so. But would you like to finish up on anything else, James? I remember uh, there's a Australian Formula One race car driver, and I loved what he says sometimes. He's, he's oh God, why is it that I can't remember his name? He, he, he drove for Red Bull for a long time. Then he went to Renault. But he'd say before a race, he'd go, let's go fuck shit up. Mm -hmm. that's all you can do isn't it? Fuck shit let's up. go fuck shit yeah. up sorry just before we finish up do you yeah. ever look at guys like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Zuckerberg and f see kind of an alien resemblance these men who are multi-billionaires how, how could you not do you know what I mean who how could men, you not oh that's wealth yeah and how have they created that have they got special powers or fucking came from different dimensions or whatever whatever you think of Elon Musk, and he's a controversial character in the United States. He might be a controversial character over here. I have no idea. The guy, he's otherworldly. He's doing vacuum tunnels. He's doing rockets. He's planning trips to Mars. He's building, if you've ever driven a Tesla, whatever you think of electric vehicles, drive a Tesla sometime, it's like a spaceship. It accelerates like a spaceship. It's quiet. It's stealthy. The technology, it's revolutionized what the automobile can be. I mean, it really is. It's so different. It's the difference between a Model T and a, you know what I mean? And I know a lot of people are like, ah, electric cars and the battery power. I get all that. But the electric motor is far superior than, than the internal combustion engine. And it's, it's like driving a spaceship. They're talking about having flying cars for 2030. Yeah, I'm sure, but Elon Musk is just doing like, how does he do all this stuff? I could barely make a documentary. This guy's doing, mm -hmm. putting like the rockets. I mean, just revolutionizing so many things. So he feels to me otherworldly, yes. Mm -hmm. Doesn't he? Yeah. 
A little bit. They've got that look and about then, them. No, what's his name from Facebook? Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg. He's got a little bit of a yeah, spooky yeah. He's look. Went Sometimes more like, alien, more alien right. now than ever. His brain just slipped into yeah. neutral. You look, look at his face and go, where's the character? Yeah. You're not human, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. But again, you can go down the rabbit hole of of conspiracies yeah. and this and that. We just don't know. We can only just ask the questions. And interviewer, I'm not an expert on it by any means. I watch a few videos and go, ah, it's interesting. Yeah. Even just having you here is very interesting to get your opinion and get your expertise on it. For them, people to go, I believe in it. Or people go, nah, they're full of shit. That's down to you. James, would you like to finish up on anything, my brother? No, that's good. I appreciate you you having me on. I really do. Um, uh, I... I been to Scotland twice. I hadn't been to Scotland before in my life that I know of. I don't think I have, but I've been twice in this last year and I love it here. I'm getting better to understand the accent. <laughs> Just a little, like first guy, he was like, oh, 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 oh. I was like, excuse me? <laughs> aliens. <laughs> Fucking aliens. A lot of them. What'd you say? Yeah. <laughs> Are you alien? How can people get in contact with you with you who maybe might have very yeah, that'd be great. Uh, much thank big you. information or to maybe help you with funding or whatever. Thank you. There's thank good you. people out there. Thank you for reminding me of bringing that up. I used to give out my, my email address, but I remember Joe Rogan looked at me and goes, don't, no, don't do that. And he's probably right because I just can't, it's, it gets too much. But I am, um, I'm my my feed is open on Twitter and I'm found it uh, at James C. Fox, 1X. C is in Charlie at James C Fox on Twitter, and you could uh, DM me. And what about Instagram? I'm very good about getting back to. I have somebody else, Alessi, and this guy, um, uh, Julian Dory, kind of been managing my Instagram lately. Um, they changed the password, and I haven't had access to it. But yes, th they will get those messages. So okay, James, boy, listen, thank you. I wish you all the best for the future. You're Appreciate a good guy, it. and I look forward to see what you do, brother. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you.